All right, well, good evening, everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I wanna start off by thanking all of you for uh, taking the time out of your busy lives and schedules to be here with us tonight. Um, my name is Erin Jones, um, and I'm a moderator for tonight's meeting. Um, I work for the US Environmental Protection Agency in the Region 4 office in Atlanta, where I serve as an emerging contaminant coordinator. And in that role, much of my work focuses on evolving issues that uh, reflect the newest and the best science that's available to EPA, and also often the policy and regulatory steps that EPA is taking to ensure protection of the human health and the environment. Um, so we're here tonight again, because EPA's mission is to protect human health and the environment. And we propose to take a series of actions to reduce health risk from a specific chemical known as ethylene oxide. Um, it's a source of air pollution in America and a source of potential risk to workers who work with this chemical as well as surrounding communities. So tonight we'll cover some background information about these health risks and the significant steps EPA is taking um, to protect workers and communities who are exposed to this chemical and also those who work, play, or go to school or daycare facilities um, near facilities that use ETO. And we'll also share some important updates from our partners. As an agency, we are committed to the meaningful community engagement and discussion on what environmental contaminants are impacting communities. This is why we're here today. And we strongly believe this communication is important and uh, that it is for us to best protect health. We need to share that information that we have with you all. It is also important that we do this in a way that's understandable and it helps uh, inform decisions that you might be making about your own lives. This is a part of why we have a lot of time set aside today to take questions from you. So if we say things that are hard to follow, or if we speak too much or with too much technical language, uh, or if we just don't cover things that are important to you, please let us know. And we will take the time to explain things in a different way or elaborate. Uh, before we turn to the presentations, I wanna take uh, time to explain how the Q&A session will work uh, after we get through the presentations. Um, so we will address your questions at the end. Um, and we will have um, several presentations by our panelists up here at the table. So as we get to that part, please use the room microphone um, if you have a question so that it can be heard here in the room. And also we do have a recording of this meeting taking place. So it'll help with the audio as well on um, being able to hear the full recording through the Q&A session. We will also have note cards available. So if you're not comfortable coming up uh, to uh, the front of the room or taking the mic and, and using that, um, you can definitely write uh, your questions down on the note card and Angela, who is in the back of the room there, she will be, uh, she'll have the mic and the note card. So um, during the Q&A, just look for her if you either want to ask a question or write it down. Uh, a final logistical note, again, we're recording this and we, it will be shared on our Fort Myers ETO webpage within the next 24 hours. Um, and so with those instructions out of the way, I want to move to the first part of our meeting and introduce those who you'll hear from today. We have a welcome from our acting deputy regional administrator for EPA region four, Carol Kempner next to me here. And we have a panel of experts who will present information, including Tony Tony, and he is our acting uh, division director for the air and radiation division here in region four. Madeline Beal is a senior risk communications advisor at EPA headquarters. And Hastings Reed over here on this end is with us from the Florida Department of Environmental Protection where he serves as the Deputy Director of the Air Resource Management Division. So at this time, we'll get started uh, with today's presentations, and I'm going to turn it over to Acting Deputy Regional Administrator for our EPA Region 4, Carol Kempker. Ms. Kempker has been with the agency for over 34 years and brings a wealth of experience in the environmental protection work in the Southeast. And in fact, she has extensive knowledge with the two statutes we'll be discussing today, which is the Clean Air Act and also the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, and you might hear us call that FIFRA. Uh, in her role as Deputy Regional Administrator, she oversees our agency goals of protecting human health and the environment here in the Southeast region. For those of you that don't know, Region 4 represents eight states, including Florida and six federally recognized tribes. Uh, Deputy Regional Administrator Kempker is a strong and passionate leader who has dedicated her career to ensuring science and the law um, guides the protection of the public health and the environment for all communities. Deputy Regional Administrator Kempler, the floor is yours. Thank you, Erin. Um, and thank you everyone for being here. Welcome. I'm 
just very appreciative that you have taken time out of your busy lives to meet us here in person today to talk about this important topic. Um, we will talk speak today, as Aaron said, about ethylene oxide. We may call it ETO at times. Um, and it is used by a facility here in Fort Myers, the American Contract Services. We held a virtual meeting this past June um, for the Fort Myers community where we covered the basic information about ethylene oxide and why and how it's used and the risks associated with it. At that time, we also covered um, a pro two proposed rulemaking actions to address ethylene oxide nationally um, to reduce exposure and risk to communities and workers. Um, so to the, um, we were also here to, or virtually here, to help provide an opportunity to receive public comment on those two national actions. That comment period has closed and your comments as well as comments from communities across the country are being considered but as we um, determine what, to, what action to take next for the national rulemaking. Um, at that meeting, Acting Regional Administrator Janine Gettle um, committed that as we got updates for this community, we would come back and we would get you timely, accurate information concerning the emissions here in the Fort Myers area. So tonight, reflects the next steps in our continued commitment to share and deliver updated information about potential risk to communities. First, we'll start by reviewing what we shared in the June meeting concerning risk from the ACS facility in Fort Myers. Second, EPA is firmly committed to protecting human health and the environment um, and health in communities facing risks from ethylene oxide. And the facility, um, so we have in the interim been working with our colleagues in Florida and with the facility itself to take actions to reduce risk. We will talk in some detail about the actions that have taken place already and about our proposed actions that will reduce risk further. We will also share information on current timelines for those proposed national actions. We are firmly committed to ensuring that you have input on the process and that your concerns are um, considered in a meaningful way. While we are not able to take comment on the proposed actions at this time because the comment period has closed, we want you to have all the opportunity to ask questions. As Aaron mentioned, we will have plenty of time for a Q&A session with our presenters and technical experts. And if there are questions we can't answer tonight, we will do our best to answer them um, through our website, our mailbox, region for ETO at epa.gov. Tonight, you're going to hear about the work that we're doing to understand and reduce risk to people who live near facilities like the ACS facility near here. EPA is also looking at how ethylene oxide might be impacting people who work at or go to school near these types of facilities across the nation. While EPA commits to working to reduce um, risk near these facilities, we are also not the only government agency working on this issue. We are working and partnering closely with our federal, state, and local colleagues to make sure we understand and consider um, and that we meet the needs of the communities, businesses, 
the health, the health care, and the workers. We are partnering with our colleagues from the Florida Department of um, Environmental Protection on the work they are doing to help EPA with reducing emissions from the facility and understanding any potential risks in this community from ETO. As Aaron mentioned, they are here with us tonight to share some updates about the facility that's specifically here in Fort Myers. We are also coordinating with other federal agencies, one of whom is the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. The Occupational Health and Safety Administration, also known as OSHA, as well as the Florida Department of Health. Again, we thank you for attending tonight. We are engaged and available to answer your questions here and ongoing. So if um, you have additional questions, please reach out to us and let us know. I will now turn back to Aaron Jones, our moderator, to kick off the presentations. Thank you, Carol. Um, I now have the pleasure of introducing uh, Tony. Tony, uh, he's EPA's Region 4 Acting Air um, and Radiation Division Director, where he oversees a team of technical experts working on air issues in Region 4. Tony works closely with local, tribal, and state governments, like the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, industry, and others to achieve and maintain clean outdoor and indoor air, including reduction of exposures and risks associated with criteria and hazardous air pollutants, like the ETO risks from the commercial sterilizer in your community. Tony, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Aaron. As we go through this presentation, you will hear us refer to this chemical that we talked about, ethylene oxide, by a number of different names. Sometimes it's called ETO, sometimes it's called EO, and then by its um, commercial name, ethylene oxide. It's the same chemical, it's different nomenclature in terms of how we identify it based on who we are and how we work with it. So that's the first thing I wanna share with you. Secondly, um, I want to tell you that occasionally people um, are exposed to this chemical. Um, and the thing that's important about it at the concentration that we're dealing with at facilities like ACS, you can't see it, nor can you smell it. Um, but the key factor that we look at is how long people are exposed to the chemical at certain concentrations. As we look at the uses of ETO, ETO is used in a number of ways. Uh, more specifically, ETO is used to sterilize medical equipment and dental equipment that's used for offices so that when a person goes into for whatever procedure, surgery, or just a stitch or two, the equipment is clean, it's non-contaminated, all the germs and bacteria have been eliminated, and their health would be protected from that perspective. The second thing that we understand about ETO is that it's used um, to make antifreeze, plastic bottles, things like that. Those items we're not talking about in this setting. Um, we're talking strictly about the ETO that comes out of the facilities that does the sterilization process. Additionally, another big use that we'll talk about this evening is the use of ETO in spices also to kill germs and bacteria. And my uh, colleague, Madison, Madeline, is gonna talk more about that when she speaks. But for ETO, it is a concern for us, and we want to make sure that you understood that we are here to help you understand how this chemical may adversely impact your health um, based on the emissions that are coming out of the facility here in Fort Myers, Florida. Um, the one thing about ETO that we do want to share with you, and we shared this back in June um, of this year, June 22nd, I believe the date was, that the ETO, when exposed to long, um, the chemical long periods of time, it does cause certain cancers, um, lymphoma, um, blood cancers, and things of the like. And we do want to make sure that you understand what the risk coming from this facility is in terms of that aspect as well. Um, we are also concerned about the fact that ETO, it, it affects people differently in terms of their susceptibility and vulnerability. Children being more susceptible because their bodies are young, they're growing, they're developing. So we are extremely concerned about how this chemical impacts children. And all of that information is factored into the conversations and the decisions that we have based on the risk information we are looking at from this facility. 
Now, from time to time in this conversation, you'll hear us talk about the risk that's posed from ETO. When we look at the risk that's posed from ETO, we look at the risk and, and our numbers, and I'll talk a little bit more about it, but we look at how much how much concentration is of exposure and the time frame for that exposure. And in our risk modeling, we always try to ensure that we are protective of human health and the environment by using conservative values when we do that, meaning that the numbers we use in our risk modeling calculations are higher um, than what they are probably presented from the facility, just to ensure that we are protective of human health and the environment. So when we um, look at this, we have to consider the amount of time that people spend in the area where the ETO is being admitted. We look at um, the risk um, from a couple of different perspectives, what the concentrations are and how long the people living in the community are exposed to the risk. And do we take other factors into consideration when we're doing that? But all of that is to make sure that we are looking at the health um, particularly for the most vulnerable, which I say for children. Now, at this time, I guess we're going to turn over to Madeline. Sure. And if it's okay, I'm going to walk. I like to stand so I can actually see you guys a little bit, if that's all right. Um, so I'm I'm mostly going to talk about what we're doing about this issue as an agency, and we're doing it in partnership with the state of Florida. And I don't want to um, uh, take any of that away from my colleague Hastings, who's going to talk a little bit as well. Um, but I also just want to start by saying um, I've done a few of these meetings now, and it's none of them get any easier. Um, I think it's it's hard to sit in an audience uh, in a room like this. I can only imagine how it feels um, to sit in an audience and hear that there might be a risk to your family um, in your community. Um, I drove over to, over to the evangelical school, uh, evangelical, evangelical Christian school yesterday. And I walked around some of the neighborhoods on the other side as well. Um, just to try to understand what it's like to live here. Um, and I, I know I can't really understand it from just walking around, but what I will tell you that, you know, I, I, if you're upset with what you're hearing, if, if you're angry, like it's totally reasonable. Um, you know, I, I can only imagine what it feels like to, to sit in an audience and, and hear what we're talking through. Um, I do feel like there's some good news here, which is that a lot of actions are, are being taken um, and that this risk number is changing. Um, but I also just want to validate that your responses are, are totally fair and it, 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 it's up to you how you feel about these things. Um, so I'm gonna talk for just a minute, um, just sort of recap what uh, Tony covered a little bit, just because sometimes when we, as an agency, think about risk, we think about what would happen if a million people were exposed and nowhere near a million people live near this facility. Um, and so sometimes it's hard to then translate that the way that we talk about things into what it means for you as a person and what it might mean for your family. So I just wanna cover some of the questions that you might wanna consider for yourself if you're trying to understand what this risk might mean to you. Um, so the first is, you know, if you live in, in near this facility, um, you know, the risk really is a, a factor of these three things, right? It's, it's how close are you to the facility um, and the further away you are, and I know there's a map outside and Tony's gonna to talk about the map in a minute, um, but the further away you are, um, there is less ETO in the air because the ETO does dissipate with space. Um, the second is, how much ETO is actually coming out of the facility. Um, and that can also change over time. And it certainly will change, has changed um, with things that have happened at the facility um, since we were here last. Um, and then the, sec the third thing here is how long you are exposed, right? So this is the number of hours you spend close to the facility every day, um, but also how many years have you actually lived here? And I think Tony sort of covered this a little bit, but when we think about how long, we make some very like extreme ass assumptions. We assume you live in, in that house and you don't leave, for 70 years, because we wanna make sure that we're protective of people who really do spend all of their time near a facility like this one, um, but we understand that most people don't. So for most people, the risk numbers probably aren't as high as we sort of are estimating they are, um, but we wanna protect people who, who are in that situation. Um, and then for workers, the risk, the questions are a little bit different, but they're similar, right? Um, the questions for workers really are, how much ETO is used where you're working? Um, and, uh, are there protective measures in place, right? So are there already protective measures at this facility that would help protect workers? Um, and then finally, again, how many years? And for workers, we're looking, we don't look at a 70 year lifetime for workers, we look at an eight hour workday for 35 years. So we're trying to look at an entire career to make sure that we're protective of someone who spends their entire career in a facility like this one. Well, we set the rules. Um, so I'm gonna pivot a little bit and just talk about some of the things that we're doing as an agency. Um, 
Aaron already alluded to this. It's going to get a little bureaucratic. I'm going to do my best. Um, it's important for me. To, it's important to me that you understand what we're covering. So if it doesn't make sense when we get into the bureaucratic stuff, just please tell me. Sometimes it doesn't make sense to me either, and I work at the agency. Um, but the way it works in, in government, right, is we can only enforce the rules that we are allowed to enforce by law, right? And there are two sort of big laws that allow us to do this work. The first one is a Clean Air Act, and the second one is a Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, which I will probably just call FIFRA from now on because it's a mouthful, but FIFRA is also, uh, it's a crazy acronym. Um, so the first one here, right, is reduce ETO coming out of facilities. We can do that through the Clean Air Act. So I'm gonna talk about the things that we can do to prevent ETO from coming out of facilities like this one. Um, the second one is reduce ETO risk when people are using it as a pesticide, and that's the FIFRA piece. When uh, ETO is used to sterilize medical equipment, it's used to kill germs, right? It's killing bacteria and viruses, and that is a pesticide. So it's being used as a pesticide, and EPA has some, some authority over that. And then finally, um, uh, my colleague Hastings is going to talk about this, but we're going to talk a little bit about some of the partnerships that we do with the state because we, we don't do this work alone. But first, Clean Air Act. How do we prevent ETO from coming out of facilities like this one? So basically, there's a set of, uh, there's a part under the Clean Air Act um, that allows us to set emission standards for how much ETO can come out of facilities like this one. Um, and that's, I think, all for this one. I'm going to take a step back and talk about why we did the things that we did um, to try to prevent more ETO coming out of these facilities. Um, and because I think it's helpful to understand like why we put what we put in this proposal. Um, it, it does go into a little more detail, but I, I hope it's helpful. I, I think it's helpful to understand sort of the why we're proposing what we're proposing. Um, but before I even get there, I wanna just talk about the national picture a little bit. I'm sure you are mostly interested in what's happening here in Fort Myers, um, but I do want you to know that this is not the only facility in the country where this is an issue. Um, there are approximately 86, I think, in, you know, Sometimes they open, sometimes they close, um, but we think there are about 86 in the country right now. This was the official tally um, back in June. Um, and when we looked at this uh, risk issues, you know, like maybe a quarter of them, a third of them had risk levels that were at a level that we were, as an agency, felt needed additional action. Um, and so Fort Myers is was one of those back in June, um, but things have changed. And so going forward, I think the picture is gonna be better for you all. Um, but right now, um, you know, we're still here because we want to make sure that you understand what's happened in the past. So the next slide, please. Okay, so um, when we think about trying to prevent ETO from coming out of facilities like the one like ACS here, um, it's important to sort of un understand like where the risk is coming from. And a lot of the work that we've done as an agency over the last couple of years was to get into the weeds, uh, get into the details with these facilities and understand exactly what processes they were using what controls they have in place, uh, what ETO might be coming out from different ways from these facilities. And one of the things that we learned from that process as we looked across the country was that um, there are two types, well, we knew this part, but there are two types of ETO that can leave a facility. The first is ETO that gets sort of like sucked up in, like if you have a hood over your oven, right? It gets sucked up into something like that, and then it gets actually cleaned out, right? So it's a much higher tech version, right? But it gets sucked into something and then it gets cleaned uh, through um, control systems that actually take the ETO out of the air, um, break it down, and then release a much smaller por por bit of ETO out of a chimney or a stack. Um, those are called stack emissions. Um, the other type of emissions that come out, right, are what we call fugitive emissions. They are what they sound like. They're emissions that escape, right? They're running away. Um, and they can escape through do leaks and doors or windows um, in, in the, other pieces, right? So sort of any sort of gap um, they, can, they can escape through. And what we found as we did this analysis was that fugitive emissions were actually driving risk at a majority of facilities around the country. So overall, they're a small amount of risk, but they actually are driving, I mean, they're a small amount of the ETO that's used, but they are actually driving risk because of where they come out um, and because they're uncontrolled. Um, the current regulations on the book today, right? do not say anything about fugitive emissions at all. Um, and so one of the things that was really important for this proposal was to make sure that we're actually taking steps to reduce these emissions um, because up until now, there's been no measures to reduce them. I mean, we have worked together to do it, but in, in the law, there's no measures to reduce them. Um, 
because I'm going to cover all of the things that we're doing sort of at a high level in the proposal for the Clean Air Act, which is the part that reduces the amount of ETO that comes out of these facilities. So the first, as I mentioned, is to capture and control and destroy those fugitive emissions. Um, and the, a lot of what we see the risk reductions coming from the proposal are in that space. Um, but the second is we're not ignoring the stack emissions either. We're increasing um, how strict the stack emissions have to be for facilities um, so that they're actually capturing more and destroying more and less is coming out of the stack as well. And then finally, because we believe those two things are lower risk. We also want to be accountable. Um, so we're actually making sure that these systems work. And so we have a lot of information or a lot of new requirements in the proposal um, that will increase monitoring to make sure these systems are working, um, increase some of the speed of monitoring, like so that we get more frequent reports. Um, and so, because you got to make sure that it's actually working what you actually propose. So we're committed to both reducing the risk, but to making sure the risk stays reduced in communities. I will say just as a caveat, um, these are all, so this is a proposed rule. Um, when I talk about the pesticides part, it's a proposed interim decision, it's bureaucratic language. It's not a rule. They, they get mad at me when I call it a rule, but basically the same concept, but these are both proposals. Um, what actually comes out at the end, um, I can't guarantee, I can tell you what's in the proposal, but I can't tell you what's gonna come out at the end because we're still working on it. So it may look more or less like what I'm describing today, but this is what's proposed. Um, and, and we are confident the risk will be much lower from, from the Clean Air Act side. Okay, so next up is to talk about the pesticide piece. Um, am I talking too fast? I feel, okay. Right. okay. Um, so the pesticide piece, uh, when we think about, um, like if you, uh, I don't know, some of you have probably used pesticides in your life, right? When you, when you buy a pesticide, there's like instructions on it that says, you should wear this kind of equipment or you should only use this in this situation. You shouldn't use this near a school or, you know, those sorts of things. Or like, if you see like where people apply it on lawns, like keep dogs away. Pesticides have all sorts of rules associated with them on the label. And EPA gets to say, what is safe for a label, right? And so as a part of this, we look at the benefit of the pesticide, but we also look at the risk of the pesticide. And then we get to sort of decide uh, how it is used. And so that, that's what under FIFRA, um, and that is what that work is governing. Um, can I do the next slide? Okay, so before we, like, like what I went into with the Clean Air Act, right? Before we actually made a proposal, we actually did an analysis to try to understand details about what would actually work to reduce the risk. And so the analysis that we did for the FIFRA side looked at different types of workers who use ETO in different settings. Um, and some of the risk levels were alarming. I will, I will, I will not mince my words. Um, some of the risk levels to workers were quite alarming, um, but we also needed to understand like in what settings uh, those risks were happening and then what actions might help to protect workers. Um, so I will say we saw, and I, this is also the piece where um, for those of you who are, I, I saw you nodding when I mentioned the school, for those of you who are concerned about going to school nearby or, or working nearby as well, this regulation allows us to look at people who work or go to school near these facilities too. The Clean Air Act only lets us look at people who live near facilities, but this one allows us to look at people who are maybe just around the use. Um, so they also looked at folks who go to school near these facilities and, and work near them as well. The highest risk levels by far were for people who directly use ETO in their jobs. Um, so, um, but all of the other things that we're proposing would, would be helpful to those who also work and go to school near these facilities too. Um, and then there are maybe slightly lower risk, I, I guess that's the point I just made, that there are some risks for folks who are nearby, but they're not as high, so. So what does FIFRA do? Um, so this again is what's in the proposal, um, but we're proposing a lot of things in FIFRA in the, it's called a proposed interim decision. Um, and so we're proposing one uh, that you could probably use less ETO to have the same outcomes, right? So we wanna make sure that when medical equipment, if you go to the doctor's office and you get an IV, you don't want there to be any bacteria or viruses in there, right? You wanna feel safe going to the doctor and getting your IV. Um, so we're working, we've been working with the FDA because the Food and Drug Administration actually sets the rules for what it means to have a sterile syringe or catheter or IV when you go to the hospital. But we believe that there are some ways that we could perhaps reduce the amount of ETO that's used to sterilize that stuff, but still make sure it's sterile. Um, so that's one of the things that's in the proposal. Um, the second is to reduce worker exposure. So to try to limit, there are lots of different things that under this bucket, right? It's a big, a big, a big bucket, but uh, there's some things that are sort of in the space of HVAC, right? Like maybe changing the ways in which um, 
HVAC systems operator, maybe just removing workers from the, oh, I guess that's a bug. Um, um, but also maybe just removing workers from some of the higher risk areas for more parts of their day. But there are, there are a lot of things under that piece. Um, the third thing um, is to increase, so PPE is uh, personal protective equipment, but to increase uh, instances where workers are using personal protective equipment, but also to, if possible, try to link that with monitoring information. So if we see real time that there's a large spike in ethylene oxide in an area of the facility, then immediately those workers would be required to wear personal protective equipment. And that whether they're in the actual environment where the EPO is being used, or if they're in an office space. Um, so I don't, this would not apply to this facility, uh, this number four, um, but there are some uses for ETO where we think there are alternatives, like it's used in beekeeping, for example, it's been used in museums, um, like if you have like an artifact that you wanna sterilize. Um, and so we think there are some alternatives to those uses. We don't think there is an alternative to medical sterilization for a lot of things. Um, so it wouldn't apply to this facility, number four. And then number five wouldn't apply to this facility either, but there are some smaller ETO um, uses within like, doctor's offices and, and uh, vets. And so we're proposing more uh, requirements there too, but these four and five don't really actually apply to this facility, but I wanted you to have the full picture. Um, okay, so I'm gonna uh, uh, go back for just a second. This is like the overview, right? So to sort of bring everything back to everything I've covered so far, there are essentially two big buckets of actions that we're doing, right? So this first one um, is the FIFRA part. The blue is the FIFRA and the green is the Clean Air Act. So the blue is going to help protect workers and communities, right? Because the actions that actually use less EPO, some of those things in that space are going to actually also reduce the amount of EPO coming out of the facility too. Um, and then it's going to apply to both the healthcare sterilizers, so like smaller doctor's offices and nurses, I mean doctors and vets and dentists, um, but it will apply to the commercial sterilizer as well, uh, which ACS is. And then the green part uh, is the Clean Air Act, um, and that one will help reduce the amount of EPO that comes out of facilities, will help protect communities, and will specifically only apply to commercial sterilizers. So the timeline for all this. Um, so the proposal was in April. Um, both proposals came out at the same time because we did, we tried to coordinate because we knew this was a big issue. And um, we wanted to make sure that both rules, or one of them's a rule and one of them's a decision, but the two things together helped protect across the board. Um, Public comment period closed uh, at the very end of June, tail end of June. Um, we expect, um, usually it takes about a year. I will tell you the Clean Air Act will be out in March. It's ahead of schedule, but um, it's because the court said we had to. I'm not gonna try and say it was because we, uh, we did it out of the goodness of our heart, but we did. We, we have been trying to move fast. We really have. Uh, but the, the Clean Air Act will be out in March. Um, and then uh, we expect the interim decision for FIFRA probably about a year after comment closed. Um, that's the typical timeline. And then once it's actually, once you actually have the proposed things final, then it's sort of the adventure splits here. Um, we're expecting 18 months for the Clean Air Act um, to be final. At least that's what's in the proposal so that to actually be implemented. So once the proposal is final, the facilities would have 18 months to do everything that we told them they had to do. For the FIFRA side, they're more complicated. Um, there's not like a single deadline. It depends on how hard the action is that we're proposing. So if it's something that we think they can do in a year, we make them do it in a year. If it's something that we know, like if they have to rebuild HVAC systems, um, that can take a while um, and sometimes have supply and demand issues with it. So some of the things might have a longer timeline. Um, but I can tell you, we're trying to make it as fast as we can, but we also have to do what's feasible um, or again, uh, we have to we have to follow the law, and the law says we have to do what's feasible, especially under FIFRA. Um, okay, and so the final thing here, right? Also, so these these are these first two are things that EPA is really working on in terms of the regulations and uh, the laws that we are allowed to 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 build and enforce to reduce risk. Um, but the next part is partnerships to reduce risk, um, and we don't do this work alone. We work very closely with our state colleagues. Um, and Hastings uh, is here uh, to talk about some of the work that we've done in partnership with Florida. Um, it is Hastings next. Yeah, okay. All right. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Hastings Reed. I'm the Deputy Director of the Division of Air Resource Management um, for the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. I'm based out of Tallahassee, and we manage the state's air regulatory program. 
So our job is to implement the Clean Air Act of Florida, which means when EPA writes regulations, we are the, the entity that permits and takes enforcement and makes sure the facilities are complying with EPA's regulations. So that's what we have been doing uh, around the state for many facilities, including the American Contract Systems Facility here in Fort Myers. Um, so for the past, uh, the, the regulation is, you know, uh, almost 30 years old that we've been implementing. And so, you know, that regulation is now being proposed to be replaced. Um, so for the past, you know, 20, 25 years, that's the regulation that we have been implementing. The facility at ACS Fort Myers uh, was permitted in 2011 and began operation in 2012. And we have been making sure that that facility is meeting the regulations that are applicable to it by issuing permits, conducting inspections, making sure that they're meeting all of those. Um, when EPA has proposed these new regulations, when those are final, the Department of Environmental Protection will be responsible for creating a permit that has all of these new requirements in it and will also be responsible for going out and doing compliance inspections, reviewing records, and making sure that they're doing all those things. And if there are any issues with the facility uh, meeting those requirements, that's where we can then take enforcement if that is needed. So, you know, our job is to implement EPA's regulations. But uh, since these regulations have come out, uh, been proposed, uh, we have been working with the American Contract Systems Facility to try to expedite their uh, installation of controls. So uh, Madeline talked about stack emissions and fugitive emissions. At these facilities, they use a relatively small amount of ethylene oxide versus other commercial sterilizers in the country. But due to the amount of ETO they use, they were not required under the old regulations to have controls. So we have worked with them. In fact, we, we issued a permit that authorized them to install what we call a dry bed scrubber, which basically like Madeline talked about, it's basically a control device where the air is pulled through it and the ETO reacts and you know, controls the vast majority of the ETO going out before it goes out the stack. And so those controls were installed in June and the department did issue a press release uh, to the local area to let everybody know. Um, we partnered with EPA in getting that message out to the folks that attended uh, the previous meeting. And um, so that significantly reduced the emissions of the facility. Um, so not long after that, they did a preliminary test um, and the preliminary results showed what we expected, which is the controls are doing a great job of reducing the stack emissions. Um, then they completed a full regulatory test, uh, which is following very specific and regimented methods for telling us what the control efficiency was. And those came back meeting EPA standards. Um, those test results have been submitted to us, they've been reviewed, and they have been loaded onto our publicly facing website. So all that stuff is, is out there and available for the public. Um, you know, the other issue, right, is that there are still fugitive emissions, like Madeline talked about. Um, at a facility that uses a small amount of ETO like this, the fugitive emissions are no longer driving the risk, right? The, the risk from this facility was associated with the stack, uncontrolled stack emissions. Now that the pollution controls have been installed, uh, the, that was the vast majority of emissions from this facility. And so that has substantially reduced the risk. Um, EPA's new regulations will come out and we expect that those will have additional controls for the fugitive emissions, which will further reduce the risk. So when those regulations come out, uh, because we implement the Clean Air Act in Florida, we will make sure that the permit uh, that they get has all those new requirements in there and we will make sure they are complying with them. Uh, one other thing that we are doing uh, as we speak is that we have asked ACS to come in and get a, a, a more bespoke permit for their facility. They've been operating under what we call a general permit. So about a month ago, they applied for uh, a new permit that will codify all of the existing requirements of the, you know, the 25 year old rule and also make sure that the new controls that they put in um, are working as they are intended to and you know, have specific requirements to ensure continuous compliance. So we are working with the facility for that, and we do expect to issue a permit with those requirements in it uh, in the not too distant future. So um, I appreciate uh, being here, and uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you, Hastings. I'm now gonna turn it back to Tony, who is going to walk us through how EPA models risk 
as well as he'll share a new modeled risk map now that uh, for Fort Myers, now that the controls are in place. So Tony. Thanks, Aaron. Um, as she said, I'm going to kind of walk you through the analysis that EPA performed on this facility um, back in June when we, when we met with you on the 22nd and then what it looks like today. Um, but before I do that, I do want to share with you again, and some of this information might be repetitive, but we think it's important for us to keep saying it so that you can clearly understand it and put it into context in terms of the entire project that's going on with the ACS facility here in Florida. Um, when we look at risk, we look at a couple of things and uh, we look at the chemicals that's coming out. In this case, it's ETO, ethylene oxide. We look at the concentration of that chemical. We look at the people that live in the community, in the neighborhoods around the facility. And we look at how long they've been there, as well as we look at the number of houses that are in that community as well. And from that, um, EPA took the information, the best available information that we had at the time, and we punched the numbers. We looked at the concentration, we looked at the housing locations, and we looked at our time frame, which we um, said time and time again, that we look at a person that lives in this community 24 hours a day, seven days a week, from birth to the age 70. And we use that to calculate our risk. And we do um, assume that that is a very high risk because people don't live in those conditions. But we do want to make sure that we are protective of human health and the environment. So we do use those numbers to help us calculate that risk. And then from there, um, we went on and we developed what we call the uh, block map to show what the risk levels were coming from this particular facility in Fort Myers, Florida. Now, as Hastings said, the emissions that we looked at are both out of the stack, uh, uncontrolled out of the stack, as well as fugitive emissions. And when we took those emissions and plugged them into the map, um, we showed to you on last June, the map that is on the left side of the screen. And based on those inputs, the concentration, the weather conditions, the location of the houses, and assuming that people was exposed sitting on their front porch, looking at this facility 24 hours a day, seven days a week for um, birth to the age 70. And then we punched those numbers in and came out with the risk. The risks that we shared with you back in June on the map on the blue side, on the left side, the blue is the area of um, higher concentration. And as you move closer to the facility, you're looking at an increase in those concentrations. Now, the yellow part of that map, as we shared with you back in June, that is the facility itself. And in that yellow area, it's important to know that there are no homes there. It's just a facility and some other industrial um, businesses, but no homes are in that yellow area. And from that number, um, from that map, rather, the blue part, um, it went out from 100 in a million all the way down up to, to rather the deeper blue shade, which is 600 in a million. Now, when we use that number, what we're saying is that if we had a million people living in that community, 100 of them would have a potential increased incident of getting cancer. So those, that's what we mean by 100 in a million. And so here, the risk level was between 100 all the way up to 600, the closer you got to the facility. Um, and the yellow part, like I say, was the facility itself and some other industrial businesses around that. And Madeline talked about how that is regulated under the PID, under the Fifth of the Worker Protection, OSHA, and those um, different agencies. But once we were able to, Hastings and his team to meet with the facility, talk to them about what's going on, share the need with them, and they went on and put the controls in and got the testing back. The great news is, is that the blue blob that you see on the left side, which is what it was in June, now is gone. It's, it's been mitigated totally on the right-hand side. So the risk on the right-hand side from this chemical with the controls in place, and that's just the stack emissions, has gone down less than 100 million, which is where we needed to be because at 100 a million and above, EPA is concerned about what going, what's going on. Um, we feel a little bit more comfortable about the safety of the residents if it's less than 100 million. So today, um, with the controls in place for the stack, those emissions are less than that 100 million benchmark that we look at um, for safety of the um, community. And so the, and the next thing um, that we, uh, and Hastings said it very clearly, but I will say it again for the benefit of this conversation, is that the next thing we're looking at is when the next when the rule is finalized and comes out, anything 
Additionally, that needs to be addressed, will be taken care of through the permitting process that Hastings and his team are going to do. So, but now the good part is, and the great information that we want to share with you this evening is that because of the actions thus far, we have gotten the risk down in this community to a level that we are not as concerned as we were when we were back in June. Thank you, Tony. I'm gonna to turn it to uh, Carol to close us out on our presentation side right before we start Q&A. Thank you, and thank you to all of our presenters. Um, as my colleagues mentioned today, the best solution to reducing risk from ethylene oxide is to reduce the amount of ethylene oxide that leaves the facility. Um, Hastings went through what actions have been taken to date to drastically reduce those emissions of ETO leaving the facility. Um, and now I'll summarize some key points from the evening and what some of our next steps are. So first, EPA did learn that EPA, ETO potentially is causing a higher risk um, to communities and workers. Two, we have taken, um, we have proposed comprehensive solutions as Madeline described um, through both the Clean Air Act and through the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act to reduce those emissions and therefore reduce the risk from ETO. And three, we collected um, public comment on those proposed actions. That public comment is being um, thoroughly looked at, concerned to shape what our final actions will be. And fourth, um, the interim um, actions that have been taken um, to reduce the ethylene oxide emissions at the ACS facility here in Fort Myers has successfully been measured to have greatly reduced those emissions here. The next steps will be um, for EPA to finalize um, national actions under the Clean Air Act and under FIFRA to then implement across the country, including here in Fort Myers with her partners, the Florida Department of environmental protection. And with that, I will turn it over to Aaron to take us through a Q&A session. Thank you, Carol. So again, we're wanting to make sure we have plenty of time tonight to answer your questions. Um, and so in addition to the panel that you've heard from already this evening, I'm gonna introduce a few more experts who've not spoken yet, who will also be with us for Q&A. We have two representatives uh, from our Region 4 Air and Radiation Division, uh, on Tony's staff. We've got Seneca Anderson and Sarah Watterson. They're up here at the front. Um, they both have experience working on technical aspects around ETO facilities. So as I said at the opening, we're going to do our best to get through as many of these questions as we can at the end of tonight. If we don't get to your question or you feel we didn't answer it fully, again, we've got our region for ETO at epa.gov um, mailbox. So we can definitely continue the conversation through that. And again, we'll do our best to answer those questions um, as quickly as possible. Again, we'll have note cards. So we've got um, Angela at the back. She's got note cards and the room microphone. So however you wanna ask your question, feel free to use either option. Um, and just raise your, if you use a note card, just kind of raise your hand when you've got the card, Angela will, will get it up to the front here. Um, and again, one final note to repeat here before we do start this Q and A, is that we are not able to officially take comment again. I know we've, we've said this multiple times tonight, but it's important um, that we can't take comment on EPA's proposed actions. We did run through them again, but the comment period is closed, um, that we can take questions on what we propose, but it's not, not for official comment purposes. Um, so now I invite those of you with questions to please use the microphone or to submit a note card and our panel will work to respond. Yes. Let's do put the lights back on. Yes. Next question. Got anyone who wants to ask? Yeah, go ahead. 
Hi, good evening. My name is Christina. Um, I have two boys over at ECS. My oldest has been at ECS for well over seven years now. So I'm sure you can understand my concern. Yes. My child is there more than he is at home um, between sports and after school activities. And as we all know, our children are just at school a lot, um, just alone in aftercare. They're in the park the whole time, uh, as well as a couple of recesses and PEs outside. It's a lot of time outside. Ever since my son has started ECS, I'm not gonna lie to you, he has had a lot of respiratory issues. It's all been thinned on to being some kind of uh, asthma or uh, allergy, which when we did allergy panels was all negative. Now my second child has started at ECS um, about a year ago and has now begun to give us all of the same issues. Uh, my daughter at home has none of these issues. He has tested negative for all of the virals that panels that can be performed under the sun for respiratory. And now they're giving him inhalers because he's being, um, he's having wheezing and all kinds of symptoms that sure can be a lot of things, but are very scary because they go hand in hand with exposure right now. With that being said, and me doing research, I'm trying to understand, um, on your website, it says that you guys are still conducting research. So how are you so sure that these maps are so accurate if on your website you say that the EPA also is conducting research to learn more about how ETO moves through the environment and to develop methods to more precisely measuring it in the outdoor air? This is on your website. So how can you guys tell us that these maps, because if you pull up this map, we are right outside of that yellow zone, right outside of it. Understand, understand. and I have asthma too, so I know how scary that is, especially with children. Um, so I understand your concerns and, and want to fully understand what might be causing that. Um, as far as research, EPA is, is, is always, always doing research on, on everything uh, that's important as far as environmental risk and exposure. So we're always looking to learn more so that we can be as protective as possible and make sure that we don't miss anything. Um, but I think I will turn it to Madeline uh, to kind of speak to some of the exposure um, assumptions that were made and so you can kind of understand how the actions that we're taking uh, may fit to the kind of the, the risk assumption where you're going to school or daycare and kind of the hours of the day that you spend there um, and how that factors in. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, well, and I just, I want to echo what Aaron said that um, I'm sorry you're having to worry about your kids this much. Um, I mean, I know we all worry about our kids, but this is another level of worry and that's not, that's not okay. Um, so I think there are a couple of things that are in your question. Um, and so I'm going to take the easier part first, which is the, the part about sort of the research that we're doing and these maps, right? Um, so one, and I, I know we sort we, we, said this a little bit, but we didn't maybe go into enough detail to sort of explain like why we think this map is right. Um, and this is a modeled map, right? And so modeling versus monitoring is, is part of what you were talking about. Um, and so when we talk about monitoring, it's like you actually go out and you put a little canister outside and it takes in some air over the course of a day. And then we send that to a lab and we figure out how much ETO is in it. We are not very good at monitoring for ETO. Um, it's it just scientifically, it's a very hard chemical to monitor for. Um, and so that we we're doing a lot of research to try to get better at that because it, if we could monitor better, it would help us know exactly what's going on um, in communities more than we do now. But we're pretty good at modeling. And so this is all based on, on modeling analysis. And so we, we collected as much detail as we could from ACS as possible about all of those things, right? Hastings and and Tony covered like the types of control systems they have, how much ETO they're using, where they're using it, where it comes out of the facility. And then we use that on weather because weather actually matters too, right? And then we use that to figure out, I'm sorry, I thought the map was still up there, but we use that to figure out where the ETO goes. Um, and the model actually helps us as of now more than monitors do because it allows us to get a better picture, like you're saying, of like a larger area of where the risk is. Um, and I will also say the yellow part, right? The yellow part doesn't mean there's no risk, right? The yellow part just means people don't live there. Um, so we are very concerned about what's happening in the yellow too. Um, okay, so I think that was sort of the easier part. The harder part is what does this mean for my kids, right? Um, and I, um, I hear your concerns. Um, 
based on what we know about the levels of ETO, it's unlikely that those sorts of, because we could consider those acute symptoms, it's unlikely that those would be directly caused by the ETO. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're not caused by something at that school, right, or something in the area. I mean, I know the airport is right there, and there are certainly things that airports, you know, I mean, I'm not blaming the airport either, right? I'm just saying there are other potential sources of, of risk that could be um, driving that. And I, I think the best sense would be, A, you could follow up with us, and we've got some more information on, on some of the other potential sources in the area. I don't know that we can speak to them tonight, but I think we do have more information about some of those potential things. Um, but B, um, we also have colleagues at the Agencies for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. And I think you had a slide on that. Can we put that slide back up, Erin? Yeah, isn't it best for children to be tested for exposure? There's no test that you can really do for ETO. Um, there, there is one, but like we almost say there isn't one because the only one that exists is if it's like really, really high levels of exposure and you have before and after testing. Um, there's really not anything that would be helpful in, in the situation that you're describing. Um, but there, there could be other things that we could look at, right? And I think, um, yeah, we can sort of try, try and think through what, what else might be happening in the community. Um, the other piece, though, that I would encourage you, um, sometimes we hear from folks in your position and they say, well, I talked to my doctor about it and my doctor didn't understand anything. Like, they didn't care, they didn't listen, right? So we can, we can potentially give you some advice on uh, somebody you could talk to who might know more about environmental health, um, because oftentimes doctors are not, trained in environmental health, and these are really environmental health issues. Um, so one is the PESU, which is this Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit. Out. Okay, did, did he respond? Okay, um, if he doesn't, you can also pester us and we can, we can because we, we support them financially, so they can, if, if they hear from us, they're, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, and then the other thing I would point you to is over here, the ATSDR clinician brief. Um, so if your doctor is not listening to you, um, it's called the ETO clinician brief. If your doctor, if you feel like your doctor isn't listening to you, it would give, it's something you can sort of give to your doctor because it's in doctor-like language and you can say, this is a serious thing. Can you please like, you know, help, help work through us? Um, but I, I wanna make sure you get those answers, right? Um, and so if there's, um, if you have trouble, if you don't get followed up, I think we wanna hear back from you, right? Um, because I, there, you know, there are potentially other things going on and we wanna make sure it's spelled up. Sure. Do you guys know how many children are in that just outside of that yellow zone? They know how many people live there. I don't know that we have. Um, yeah. There's been three schools that's right on our same street. They're like mm -hmm. right there. You have 2,000 children. And their children are at yep. the highest risk, as it says on your website, yep. um, that they're, they're higher risk than certain. Yeah, for sure they are. Uh, one way we sometimes think about it is, uh, at least when we look at that 70 year risk, over half of that risk is actually in the first 16 years of life. So it is, that's one way to think through. And, yeah. Um, our school, for instance, they start as young as three months old. So these are newborns. Yeah, these are babies. 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 And I'm pretty sure the Montessori school might be right around there as well. Um, and then we have Villas Elementary. So with that being said, I just have one, and I'm sure. Why aren't they relocating this? It's not even a big facility. I drove by it. Why Why would it be so hard to just relocate it? I suppose that's and a question risk, maybe for... And risk to 2,000 children's lives, uh, as well as... The, I'm just talking about the number of the kids in school. Yeah. Not, not on top of that, this is a very busy, condensed community, as you guys might know. Just drive around at 8 o'clock in the morning and see how many kids are yeah. in the corners on bikes. You know, I, I will say one more thing about sort of how we do the kids risk stuff, but then maybe I'll turn it to, I don't know if he's things or Tony want to talk about, you know, what we can and can't do under the Clean Air Act in terms of report locating. Um, but um, when it comes to the kids, right, so you're right, and we are, I mean, I, I am worried about the kids, right? Um, but it, if it, it might feel a little bit better to know that the reason we start at first, so like we do our analysis, like we capture the entirety of a child's life in our analysis. When, we're, when I see we're being protective for someone who's been exposed for 70 years, I'm counting it as though a baby, like I'm assuming that that was a baby, right? Um, that was there for 70 years. Um, but it is a concern, right? Um, and I know that there are, I mean, you know, one thing we haven't talked about is like cumulative risk, right? But like we're talking about one chemical, right? But there are other things, right? In your community that could also be causing risk. Um, and so those things also come into play as well. And so we are certainly concerned about it and we're trying to make sure that we're as protective as possible with these new new rules, but I'll uh, pass for thoughts on relocation. All 
thank, thank you, ma'am, for your question. Uh, so under the Clean Air Act, you know, we don't choose the facilities to come to us and we make sure that when a facility is permitted that they have all of the requirements that are needed under the, the regulatory structure. So that is a, a, a geographic ambiguous question, right? Like the exact location of the facility, except in like really big facilities like power plants where we might have to do modeling to show that they uh, meet certain uh, ambient qu air quality standards. Um, for most facilities, where a business chooses to locate it is not something that we are able to consider. Questions about the appropriateness of one location to another location are generally questions for local governments that are choosing how to zone various locations, that there's an industrial location next to a residential location. Uh, you know, we are not the Lee County Zoning Department or the Fort Myers Zoning Department. We can't make those decisions. We just look at an air permit application and make sure that it has all of the Clean Air Act requirements in it. So, you know, it's not something that we are able to consider, although it, this is a challenge that we experience more times than you can think about. So we definitely understand. It that, would be the appropriate person to reach out to a question, well, to ask well, question. Uh, uh, right, right. So the, it's the local government commission who has chosen how to zone various areas. And they, that's up to them on rezoning and things like that. Um, so, you know, but we're not really zoning experts. We implement the Clean Air Act on behalf of EPA in Florida. Thank you. We've got a question in the back. Hello, my name is Chris Bory. I've uh, been in the community my entire life. I'm a local business owner. My kids go to ECS along with my uh, nieces and nephews and um, all of my family. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so I appreciate I appreciate all of you putting forth your best efforts to make our community safer and come out here and talk to us about this. One of the uh, things I want you all to know as to why there's so, so much distrust, even with these scrubbers uh, being installed, is because back in 2016, the EPA found out about the um, cancer causing effects of this ETO, and the uh, ACS pulled a permit to put the scrubbers on and did not follow through. They did not install the scrubbers. Here we are seven years later. And as soon as the news press puts out a story, months later, everything's a happen. So, you know, it shows us that they really didn't care until they were called out on it. Uh, my questions are, what are the specifications on the scrubber filters needing to be changed? And will there be a tracking log to see that these filters are being changed? And will there be annual testing to assure that the scrubbers are still working? Thank you for that question. I'm going to turn um, the specific question that you had to Hastings uh, to answer. Um, and if I would be able to do one more question after that, I don't yeah. know if you want me to ask it or just wait for the answer. Um, your preference. <laughs> I'll wait for the answer. You want to wait? Okay. Next. Great. Yeah. And I think we can also have um, Tony and Madeline maybe explain a little bit more about the timeline of the 2016 which is an iris risk assessment for ethylene oxide that tells us how toxic it is that it that there's more more to that story how we use that information we're not ready to go with regulations at that point so i'll, I'll have them explain that a little more but first your specific question on the uh thank you for your question sir so um i believe the facility applied for air permits in 2021 to put in the, the scrubbers um this was a process that began um, in 2021, uh, where we reached out to all of the ETO facilities, and you saw on the map, uh, there's a number of those in Florida. There, there are five on the on the on the map, and so we reached out to all of those facilities to gather information to help EPA make these risk assessments to determine well, how much is uh, coming out of various facilities, how much is fugitive. Um, so that facility applied for a, a, a new air permit that authorized the installation of the scrubbers in 2021. Um, obviously, 2023 is when it got installed, and I share your frustration with the amount of time that was in between them pulling that permit and getting it done. Um, it's one of those kind of supply chain, you know, there's always kind of a, a bit of an excuse for why it's taking so long. Um, but we were really trying to push them to get those uh, in scrubbers installed as quickly as possible. So as to your question about now that these scrubbers are installed, um, the question about how do we know that they're doing their job? 
So we are in the process of issuing a permit um, that uh, implements the Clean Air Act. And one of the provisions of the, the NESHAP regulation, which is called subpart O, um, that applies is that they have to submit to us a, a compliance monitoring plan. And so once they completed their test, um, which we you know, have those results, uh, like I said before, um, you know, they submit to us a, a plan for how to show that that scrubber is maintaining uh, its efficiency. So we are in the process of reviewing that and including record keeping and reporting provisions that will apply to that facility. And that's just in the interim, right? EPA's new regulations are gonna come out and it's gonna be like another order of magnitude of record keeping and reporting and stuff because that's all the stuff under their new regulation. We're implementing, it's, <laughs> it's gonna be a lot more there. You know, I don't know exactly what's gonna be in it. I'm not EPA. But you know we will implement those, and uh, I'm sure. But but in the meantime, we are trying to come up with a, a plan to give you the peace of mind that those controls are meeting the regulatory requirements that they're supposed to meet. Do you happen to know the specifications on the filters and how often they need to be changed or anything like that? Right. So we are in the process of receiving that information from them. So it depends on how much ETO they use and how often they need to change it out. So once we get the exact information about when that is, they're going to have a change out schedule that that applies, um, depending on how much ETO they use. So if it's a slow month, you know, then they might not need to change it out for a longer period of time. If it's a busy month, then, you know, a couple busy months in a row, and they might need to change out that media, we are going to require that they notify us when they're changing that out. Uh, we're going to require that they are reporting to us how much ETO is used so that we know that they are changing out the scrubbing media according to that schedule, so that we know that they're meeting those parameters. Too. So it's not just is the filter changed, it's is the ETO being removed. So, but that will take a while to implement, but that's what's <laughs> Yeah, so the, the proposal is including real time monitoring of the stack. Okay, I do appreciate that. The second question. Although it's real time that's reported periodically, just because people hear real time and they think it's like actually a feed. It's a yeah. feed, but that it's reported periodically. But so we I just know that I have uh, in my business, we do air testing, third party air testing for mold purposes. We have air scrubbers. We know that in between every project, we need to change filters, wipe down machines. So I do know that, you know, filters don't last forever. And yes, it is based on how much uh, of the chemical is used in, in, a, in a period. But we all here know that our population is growing way too fast. We can't even drive down our roads compared to three years ago. So I can guarantee you. We're not gonna be going down in the usage. Uh, my next question was, if this chemical dissipates so quickly as mentioned, then can this facility be asked to work at night instead of during the day? Because during the day, that's when people are at school. That's when people are outside of their homes. Whereas at nighttime, everybody's asleep inside of their house. Kids aren't at the school. There's a lot less people out over nighttime. I would imagine as uh, big of a uh, corporation as Lee Health and Sarasota Health Systems are, as they're the shareholders of this corporation, uh, they could pay the workers to work at nighttime, night shifts, so that we don't all have to, you know, be so worried if they're not going to move the facility, because that was the other part of my question, but uh, the, the, the woman before me asked that. So if they're not going to move their facility, could they be at least asked to work at night so that it reduce the risks? So it does dissipate quickly, but not that quickly. So, I mean, I, I think that I'm not sure that would solve the problem, but I think in terms of operational hours, like a lot of these facilities, are, I mean, does this one run around the clock? Some of them do. So this facility operates, it's a little unusual versus some of the other blue dots on the map. Um, this facility uses, uh, you know, a single item sterilizer where they fill up a, a little bag, you know, it's about the size of like a large Ziploc bag, right? And they have medical kits inside them. And so they spritz like a couple grams of ETO into that bag and they pack that bag into a box and that box goes onto a crate. And then that crate goes into one of these aeration rooms. And the process of aeration takes about 72 hours per cycle. So there's a very slow, you know, stream of ETO that's coming off for a 72 hour window. And there's probably a, you know, a curve to that, right? Where at first it's a little faster or maybe it takes a while to start, you know, cause they heat up these chambers a little bit. So it starts to cook off a little bit. So there's probably a time curve associated with their emissions as it comes out, but it is over the course 
of 72 hours. So the, the 24 hour day night cycle, I don't know that that would make a difference. And the other thing is they have six of these and the way that at this facility, they have six chambers and the way they kind of work is that they load up one chamber. So they have a bunch of people in there that are filling up these bags. They fill up each, uh, each chamber takes eight pallets. So you can imagine there, it takes a few hours to fill up one of these pallets, move it in. They do that, you know, however more, more, many more times they need to, depending on the demand from uh, the, the companies that are ordering the sterilized equipment. And then they close the door and that 72 hour cycle, actually, I think it's a 64 hour cycle. It takes like eight hours. So well, yes, I'm being told yes. So, you know, that's, it's a lot longer than a one day thing. So I, I don't know that the day night distinction. Yeah, I understand. That was my question. The only other thing that I would say that would help the trust in this whole scenario is that 99.9% .9 is not a real number that I would believe. I do air testing, as I mentioned, when people say 99.9%, .9 like your bottle of Lysol says it's killed 99.9% .9 of germs. That's, you know, more of a, uh, makes you feel warm and fuzzy inside than a real measurement. Understood. Uh, thank you for your questions. Um, Hastings, there was one more question that kind of bounces off of that, uh, that we got on the note card. Um, so I don't know if you have the, the stats on how long this facility has been operating. Yeah, so I believe it was permitted in 2011 and began operation in 2012, so. Thank you, we have, we'll do one more in the room. Okay. Hi. Um, I participated in the in the Zoom meeting back in June, and I did have some outstanding questions. I, I did not print those off, but I had contacted um, you guys by email just so you know that there were there was an outstanding communication um, that I have not had a response to. Um, my name is Marcia Ellis, and I have uh, a concern about the uh, the chemical. Um, so we I'm hearing a lot of vagueness about a known carcinogenic chemical. And um, I have a hard time believing that there are not records that could be provided of how much chemical this facility has been using over this 11 year time period to more accurately create accountability and um, determine what precise, more precisely um, what the risk is. Uh, and if that registry, if those records are not um, it, it seems to me like those could be flushed out. And I don't think it would, it needs to take discovery for that to happen. Um, I think this community deserves to have people voluntarily come forward um, in good faith and with transparency as much as possible to provide that record keeping um, so the community can better assess their risk. If there is not a registry or um, more stringent controls about uh, this chemical, where it's produced, where it's coming from, where it's distributed, et cetera. Um, I would hope that there would be, that would come on to uh, line as soon as possible. Um, I did provide public comment um, back in the day. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I do have concerns about the protocols. Um, from what understanding, the release of a mission uh, has a lot to do with when the machines are turned on, when they're turned off, start up, shut down. Um, can, there can be some variation in terms of how much a mission is being released. It's not just totally even. Um, again, uh, I think that as, as the other member of the audience mentioned, the um, uh, knowing the quantity is essential to determining protocol um, and that relying on the uh, good faith at this point of the operating facility is we've kind of gone past that because as people have commented um, that didn't happen to protect this community so I think that um, having the company develop the protocol um, it may not help people feel better given the past history that 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 should be you know brought totally out of in the open much more um i i've been reading lately about um because we did of course i'm sure that that hastings is aware of the failure at the waste energy plant and the dioxin release the furon release in our community and so um what i understand is that sometimes these facilities are uh, 
and know when the test is going to happen. <laughs> and they, you know, prepare in advance instead of it being a random, right? Like folks know they want to look good. They know the test is going to happen and it may not be truly reflective of the amount of admission that's entering into the community. Um, so I have some concerns about that. I uh, also had wrote concerns about the amount of emission that was being released in transport um, and in the warehouse facilities. I would like to know where those warehouse facilities are in this, this county, where these things are being stored, um, who's responsible for uh, monitoring how much is building up in the back of the gas truck, for instance. And then um, I had a question about the scrubber down in Collier. Um, when did that come online? I know that that Arthrex facility, it's a big facility, I think. Hastings probably, probably give the details on that. Yeah, that's a 25 ton per year facility. That's what it's permitted at. And oh, so, yeah. yeah, the Arthrex facility in Ave Maria is, it uses 25 tons per year. Uh, it's one of the la larger facilities in Florida. Um, it's more of what I would, and I'm sure what EPA would consider a traditional sterilizer that uses a sterilization chamber where instead of just the little baggies, it's got, you know, uh, a full chamber. They load in pallets that haven't touched any ETO. And then that chamber is inundated with ETO. And then all of the air is pulled, sent to a control device. That facility, when it was built, because it's a much larger facility, under the existing uh, regulations that are in place right now, that facility was required to be built with controls. And it does have those controls. Um, however, uh, like uh, ACS, that facility did, you know, make sure that it was uh, putting in the best controls that it could, you know, on, you know, before these regulations came into place. So I believe two years ago, um, the Arthrex facility came in um, and asked for a permit to reduce their fugitive emissions that they were emitting also. So that facility has, uh, but it has a totally different type of control device uh, called a thermal oxidizer. So that's kind of combusting the gas uh, instead of absorbing the gas uh, like a scrubber does. Um, so it's it's very different, but it, that facility has been controlled since it was installed. They're just chasing down the fugitive emissions that the Madeline was talking about. To you know, they don't emit 25 tons. They probably emit you know now now that they've installed these new controls. You know, 10, 20, 30 pounds. You know, something much smaller than the amount that they're using. Right, and it seems like that there is some knowledge of the amount of, of, of chemical that's being used at these facilities. And I think that in this, for the sake of transparency, that that should be brought forward to the public. Um, I also wanted to, uh, I have one other thought, and I can't, it's kind of escaped me, like emissions. So I'm going to pass the mic. <laughs> Can I pass you over? So, I mean, I, I think you ask a, a bunch of great questions. Um, and so I want to, I, I, but I think part of what was in there, so before I even answer a couple of them, but I do have a couple of things to share. I, we didn't really cover the history of like how we got to where we are, at least in terms of what EPA knows about ETO. And so maybe it's worth doing a little bit more on that. Um, so as was mentioned, 2016 was an important year for ethylene oxide. Um, so we have another part of EPA um, is IRS, which is the Integrated Risk Information System. I, you can check my acronyms. I may miss one here and there. Um, but that part of EPA is responsible for figuring out the best science that's out there to understand, because there are a lot of chemicals out there, right? And some of them cause cancer, right? And so that part of EPA sort of looks at like, what's the best science we have? What is the actual risk associated with these chemicals? And in 2016, um, looking at the best science that we have, uh, IRS determined the DTO is actually 40 to 60 times more toxic than we thought it was, depending on who you're talking about. Um, that was a, a big moment at EPA. Um, a lot of folks, the folks here, we're in this job because we care about, I wasn't at EPA then, but we're in the jobs we have because we care about communities. We care about these sorts of risks. When that came out, I can tell you a lot of people at EPA were very alarmed. But we didn't know yet, just because, we were, just because it's more toxic, we knew there might be a problem. We didn't actually know yet whether or not communities were at risk because we didn't know yet if it was actually getting out in a place that was causing risk. One part of this ETO story, right, is the vast majority of ETO that's used in America is actually used at industrial facilities. 
but we don't see as much risk associated with those because industrial facilities tend to not be where people live, right? To your point, like there are schools like basically across the street from this thing, right? Um, and that's true with these commercial sterilizers, but it took us a few years because we had to look at it and understand like, where is this stuff being used? Where do people live? Where is the risk? It took us a few years to get to a place where we were able to understand that, hey, this risk of this increased toxicity that we know about is actually impacting communities. And it's it's not impact, impacting communities near the industrial places because they're so far away from it. It's actually impacting communities near commercial sterilizers. And then the other piece that we just, I, mean, I think really only in the last two years came to understand is the degree to which fugitives are driving this risk. So it wasn't like there was like a moment where it was like 2016, bam, we should be in Fort Myers. I wish that it was, but we would have been here sooner if it had been. Um, it took us a while to get to understand what this is, what where this risk is. But some of this plays into the record keeping too, though. So I, I think that's part of why I wanted to give you this history is unfortunately, we're very forward look. I mean, the laws that we have, we're governed by the laws we have. We want to protect folks, but we got it, we're forward looking in terms of the laws that we do, right? Or the regulations. Um, we don't have a lot of backward looking data. Um, we have some, right? And so part of what we did to develop these proposals was actually collect a ton of data from those facilities. And it's called ICR, which is information collection request. There are all sorts of like, we can't even ask people questions without rules, right? That's the, the government, you know, but it's the way they set it up for us, right? We're, we're trying to do our best. But so we actually had to go through a whole process to actually ask these facilities questions because we couldn't just ask them legally unless we went through that process. And so we have a lot more data now from that. Um, and that is what you can find um, in the proposal. And a lot of what you're talking about actually is baked into the proposal in terms of like what's actually in use. But the other piece of good news is there is something called the Toxics Release Inventory, TRI. That's a whole other part of the agency, um, but they are responsible for reporting some of this stuff. And ETO, um, certain facilities were sort of not reporting ETO because they didn't have that much of it. And until recently, we didn't know how toxic it was. So we didn't think, like we didn't make them report because we didn't think it was a big deal. Now we think it's a big deal and now we're making all of them report. Um, so I think for the last year and a half, two years, year and a half, we do have that data and you can find it. It's on TRI, Toxic Release Inventory. It is not the easiest to use interface in the world, but it's more easy than some of the other interfaces that you'll find on EPA. Um, and so you can get the data on how much ETO is coming out of facilities from TRI. Um, I think that was most of what, oh, I just one other piece on accountability too, because you asked about that. So I, I agree with you. Like, um, I think um, this is not the first community I've been in where I have been told that they do not trust the facility to be a good actor. Um, I can't speak for that, right? I don't live here, but I'm just telling you, you're not the first person who has said that to us. Um, and so we do have, we have ways around, right? We, we, you know, the Florida folks go there, right? And they inspect. We also have our own enforcement uh, wing. So if there's any sort of, if, if things seem fishy and sometimes we can show up on an announced, right? So, um, so all those pieces do happen, but it's also like some of the ways in which um, it's not as easy to cheat the data, I think, as sometimes folks think it is, which is not to say that it's not impossible, but I think we do design things in a way, I mean, I, I won't speak for my colleagues because they know it better than I do, but we design things in a way so that it's it's not like you could just make up a number and give it to us, right? Um, there is evidence supporting what, what they say is in place. Um, I don't know if it's that reassuring, but there are accountability steps um, and, and we're not gonna stop. And then the, the new proposal has even more in place, right? Um, with the monitoring. And, and the one other point I will <laughs> emphasize in that process if we, when we get the data and we start reviewing the data, if something doesn't seem right, we contact our state environmental partners and we ask them to go out and, and give a look to see what's going on uh, realistically from that facility to make sure that the data that they're giving to us seems right. And, and actually that's what happened with the facility here in Fort Myers. When the agency received the data and started looking through it, we asked um, Hastings and his team to come down and just see what's going on for us and let us know. Um, so we'll have a better indication of what the data should look like. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Cindy Danier, and I am the mother of three children who have spent the entirety of their life in the exposure zone at Montessori Fort Myers and United Martial Arts Center. My youngest actually had an idiopathic blood disease that attacked her hemoglobin. So we are pursuing whether or not there's a connection between the ETO and her blood disease. And 
At this point, I wanna tell any of you who are parents of children have, have gone to any of these schools in the zone, since the facility is open in 2012, please reach out to me because we are looking at legal avenues. And that's any type of childhood, blood disease or cancer, anybody who's gone there because there has not been, to my knowledge, outreach to parents who are not currently enrolled in these facilities. So there is a potential for past exposure and past disease like my daughter. So I'm very concerned because my children still attend facilities in this area. I want the scrubbers to work. I wanna be assured that FDEP and EPA are playing their role in monitoring this on our behalf. So I want to ask and encourage fence line monitoring at the facility. I think this is particularly important, not only so we know what's going on at the facility, but because in that orange part that you had outlined, there's a daycare center at the Chico's facility that's in the yellow center. So, and there are children there 24 hours, you know, when people are working. So that's directly in there. So it's not people who would be otherwise in PPE or other type of equipment. And the, the Chico's facility itself has several workers there. So they should possibly be considered for OSHA and other types of exposure given their proximity in there. So I want to know if we're going to be able to have that fence line monitoring. And I'll add second question, it's not the same, but just for information, the Ave Maria Arthrex facility has their airing out storage warehouse on plantation. That's about three miles south of this facility. And I want to know what FDEP is doing to monitor the ETO in that facility, in that airing out facility, and if there is any plan for the EPA to further adopt the congressional letters um, suggestion that both warehouses and fence line uh, monitoring are included in the rule. Thank you. Thank you for your question. I'm sorry to hear about your, your child's condition. Um, I'm gonna turn it first to Tony um, to kind of speak to what's included, you know, potentially on the, on the warehouse side um, for any potential future rulemakings. Um, and then we'll, we'll go to Hastings for the more specific questions. Okay, now what was the question again, Eric? Are warehouses covered? Uh, are we going to do any store? So, if our warehouses covered in the uh, on site warehouses are covered, off site warehouses. Yes, that's okay. correct. That's correct. Okay. <laughs> All right. And then, and then we do want to speak to the fence line monitoring aspect. You do, you fence line okay. monitoring. Um, and, and Sarah Ward, who was here with us this evening, she's our monitoring expert. Um, and she has been intimately involved in looking at monitoring um, concepts and opportunities for these types of chemicals. So, um, Sarah, can fence you explain? Line monitoring is actually a source specific. Mm -hmm. I'm the community monitoring. Right. So, I think Sonic can speak to the right. requirements required to handle. But also speak to the fact of monitoring for ETO in general, the problems that we're having with that. Thank you. Uh, I will start. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Seneca Anderson. I work on Tony's staff. Um, I work on a lot of rules related to the Clean Air Act. I was part of the presentation uh, in June. Uh, so if any of you tuned in virtually, you might have seen my face then. Um, so to speak to some of the questions about what is in the proposed rule, um, currently uh, fence line monitoring is not part of the proposed rule package, but I do believe that there were some comments regarding that. So we cannot speak to what is being looked at, but those comments are being considered. Um, and I believe Sarah can speak a little bit more about uh, some of the monitoring challenges, but just in general, um, and Madeline spoke to it as well, about the difficulty with doing community monitoring sort of the canisters further away. However, in situations such as the stack, you know, sort of the chimney, in those concentrated controlled environments, where it's a lot easier to account for, you know, you don't have ambient temperatures that change wildly, you have very controlled conditions and higher concentrations. We actually are very confident about the types of uh, monitoring we can do at the stack. 
So that's why, again, Melanie mentioned having more confidence in modeling, because we can take those confident numbers through the stack, and then we can look at that and do modeling as, and that gives us much better, you know, numbers that we're more confident in as opposed to monitoring outside the facility. So um, in a number of our rules, we fence line monitoring is very helpful because you do get slightly higher concentrations at a fence line as opposed to out in the community. Um, and so I think when they first developed the, you know, the proposed rule package, they did consider that the uh, monitoring at the stack was the best way to do it, but they would be taking into account any comments that they received during the comment period about fence line monitoring. So um, like has been mentioned, we can't comment on the final rule because we don't have it yet, <laughs> but you know, we will see that um, in March when that is finalized. Um, yes. um, oh yeah, and then the warehouses, yes, thank you. Um, so on-site warehouses are, uh, well, will be part of, they were part of the proposed rule. So if the rule is finalized as proposed, on-site warehouses um, and storage facilities, parts of the facility that store a sterilized product, that will be included. And any fugitive emissions from those parts of the facilities will have to be controlled. That will be, that's not part of the current rule, but that is part of the rule as proposed. And as part of the Clean Air Act um, rule, it does not address offsite warehouses. So that is something that would have to address in future rulemakings for the Clean Air Act. However, Madeline can talk to the part of the, uh, the FIFRA rule because that would cover those situations. So I know it can be a little confusing because we have different rules that cover different portions, but by having all of those rules, we can try to get the largest coverage possible. Well, and I'll just add, we, we had lots of comments to also say that we should cover offsite warehouses. So we can't say whether they're actually gonna, I mean, they were not in the proposal, but we have, you are not the first person to bring this up. Um, and it has been framed that if it's not covered, then they will just move their warehouse, right? Um, and so um, it's, un, it's unclear what's actually gonna be in the final. Um, on the FIFRA side though, um, so FIFRA works very differently than the Clean Air Act, um, but they are considering anywhere, like any, any sort of effect of using ETO to sterilize things that could cause harm. So that includes places that are offsite, but they don't do the type of analysis that the Clean Air Act does where it's actually like facility by facility. They're looking at the whole country, but then they're making rules that would, or making sort of recommendations that would take that into account. So it is covered, but it's covered differently under FIFRA um, than you might expect based if, if you're thinking about it being covered in the Clean Air Act. Um, Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Watterson. I work in ambient monitoring for air toxics. So you're probably like, well, what's the difference between ambient monitoring and what we're talking about? And so we would consider ambient monitoring to be away from the fence line in communities where people are walking around. So there are different types of monitoring. There's the stack that Seneca was just talking about. There's the fence line, which is what we would talk about going around the facility. And those are all specific to the source. And then there's the community monitoring and the ambient monitoring. The type of equipment that we use for this type of monitoring is different because we are getting different concentrations. They're coming out in different ways. And so Seneca spoke to the fact that the monitoring and stacks, we have a lot of confidence in with that, that type of equipment is fully developed. However, the ambient monitoring equipment for ethylene oxide is not nearly as sophisticated. It is a simple stainless steel can. You crank it open, it slowly sucks in air for 24 hours, it closes, you ship it to a lab. A lab will analyze it and then you get the results in three to four months. So it takes quite a bit of time. On top of that, uh, that can will tell you what was in the air for that 24 hours at that specific location. So let's say that the wind is blowing from the opposite direction. And so if whatever is going on in the facility, if you have a can here, but the wind is blowing this way, well then you miss whatever the plume might be because of the wind speed. And so it's actually very, very difficult to analyze for ETO. The other issue that we have with it is the analytical tools that we have, the equipment, we have something called a detection limit. And so that's where we can see that a chemical is present. We, we know it's there. So we'll say that's here. But the risk level with most air toxics is very low. That level is here. 
So while you may get a non-detect, that does not mean that you're outside of that risk range. You can still be in it. You just don't know because our science is not to the point yet that we can measure that low. And that's the research that's still ongoing. We're trying to get better with our monitoring, trying to find new methods that are out there. And it's science, it, it takes time. It's a lot of experiments. Um, we may have more luck with that at a fence line because the concentrations are generally higher at a fence line. But again, there are a lot of issues with these cans and we're having a hard time getting the data to be reproducible. And so that is ongoing work. And so when we have modeling of emissions and numbers that we can, that we know and weather patterns, and we can put that all together, we have a lot more confidence in understanding what is going on in an area versus a can that you just stick out for 24 hours, one day, every six days. And I, just one, I mean, everything you said was, uh, I think very helpful uh, and uh, explained a, a lot of the, the community issues with monitoring. I, I just wanted to sort of reframe one piece of it because I think um, sometimes uh, it, we say it this way, which is oftentimes it, if you want to monitor, you're saying, I want to know that my kid's school is safe, right? I want something that's going to tell me that. Um, and realistically, we can't monitor to tell you something safe because we can't measure the levels low enough. Um, and so that's why we do think the modeling. And you said all that, but just to sort of you know reframe it a little bit, there isn't a monitor that will tell you it's safe. So how is it legal for them to keep this facility there? They can't even assure us that it's safe for them to be that close to 2,000 kids as well as the community. It's like, how is that even legal? So uh, that is a question about uh, the laws that we have in the country, um, but the Clean Air Act allows us to reduce risk. It doesn't allow us to eliminate risk. Um, and there's lot, all sorts, of, I, I don't know, do you want to speak to what the Clean Air Act lets us do and doesn't let us do? Well, you know, and I guess the, the thing to understand is when you look at the Clean Air Act, um, and then I will just kind of suffice to say that the history is just too much to talk about in this setting, but the Clean Air Act gives us specific um, areas in terms of what we're going to monitor, what types of facilities we're going to write rules for, and we go through that regulatory development scheme for those. Um, for example, um, if you're familiar with the Clean Air Act, it said that it identified 189 hazardous air pollutants back in 1990 when it came out. And it told EPA that for these 189 chemicals, you will develop standards to ensure the protection of human health and the environment. And so we have that regulatory scheme that we have to follow. And it doesn't cover all facilities. It doesn't cover all chemicals. And, um, but to suffice for that or to... to um, add for that, there are opportunities to increase or add chemicals to the list that we can consider making standards for. And, and, and you have to also consider, just like Hayson said earlier, um, facilities are permitted if they're going to be dealing with certain levels of chemicals. If they are going to be um, dealing with what, 25 tons or less for one or more chemical or 10 for one chemical, then they can get a general permit and operate. And the requirements for controls for a general permit are totally different from those of a major source. If you're looking at major sources and Title V permitting and things like that. So there's a very prescriptive process that EPA uses to determine which facilities are going to be um, regulated via permit, a Title V permit or a construction permit or a general permit, and then what chemicals will be contained and what control devices will be included in that process. Um, but I, I do want to go back because the main thing that we often tell people is that when you're looking at these facilities in your communities, the place to start with that is with the local government, with the local um, permit, with zoning committee, um, city council, or whatever entity does the zoning, because it's at that point that they determine what types of facilities can come into this community, where they can be located, and things of that nature. They did come in way after at least ECS was there. I don't know if the other schools, but I know ECS has been there for 50 years. So they came into our community well after and put us at risk. Right. And, 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 that, and that's why we encourage people to be active in, the, in that political process, that public participation process. So when they submit these applications and the notice is made that this facility is trying to get a permit, 
or come into a community that, you know, if it's something that you want to involve yourself in to make comments on and make sure your voice is heard, you have to do that. Um, I know in a lot of locales, you know, I drive through communities and I see signs saying there's a proposed meeting about this thing happening in the community and the date for the public hearing is this date. And those signs are probably about as big as a sheet of paper. Um, so you will easily miss them if you're driving down the street. But you, um, there are other ways to find the information. You can go to the local zoning office or the permitting <laughs> office and get information about what's happening in your community. Um, they're required to create you know, 15 year plan, 25 year plan to outline what can happen in that community with respect to the um, placement of sources. There's a lot of regulatory things at the local level that you can have access to to help you be in a position to voice your concerns about what's happening in your community. Uh, hi, and I just wanted to add to that. Um, you had mentioned uh, sort of asking how is it legal if they don't know how much you know they're releasing or exposing into the community. Um, and so I just wanted to comment on that, how we were saying the difficulty with using ambient monitoring to say, here, how much is right here right now? That's difficult. But with the, um, you know, sort of the, the complete, you know, the, the well-developed technology of monitoring at stack emissions, plus the fact that they have usage records, as we've mentioned, they can use those and to do the modeling that we talked about and give a much more clear picture of how much is being uh, emitted and then where it, it is being, you know, where the risk is concentrated from that. So there is ways of knowing how much is being used, how much is being released, given the control equipment. Um, well, in this case, you know, before they did not have control equipment. So we were assuming that what was used was released. But now we have the control equipment and we do have uh, faith in the technology to measure at the stack level. And the rule as proposed has a lot more requirements for record keeping, monitoring and reporting. So they will have to have much more frequent reports to FTEP and uh, a lot more requirements on how they have to monitor. So there will be a lot more accountability um, with the rule as proposed. And they do have the technology to know how much is being used and how much is being exposed. Even if it, we don't have the ambient monitoring to say exa pinpoint exactly where at any given time. The other thing I wanted to get back to, I mean, I don't want to be rosy about what's happened in the past, right? Because I understand you guys have concerns. Um, but these controls work. Like we do, we know enough to know that the controls that we're proposing take the ET out of the air before it leaves the facility, right? Um, and I, I, you know, I, I do want you all to have confidence in that because I, I mean, I, I get, it's, I'm not the technical person, right? But I trust the technical people that have dedicated the last four years of their lives to trying to figure out how to make sure ETO, less ETO leaves these facilities. Um, and a lot of, I mean, it, these controls work and, and we know that they work. We know they work from lots of science, but lots of, lots of proof as well from the, the sorts of um, testing that Seneca has talked about. So it's not so much um, that we can't stop the ETO from coming out, right? Um, I mean, I understand your concern of like, why were they allowed to be put there to begin with? Um, and that's, that's a backward looking question that's harder for us to answer, right? But the forward looking question of what can we do to stop this from going on further? I, th I think we've solved that problem. I mean, I know we can't speak on what's gonna be final in the proposal, um, but it's gonna bring the risk down. I mean, risk has already come down a lot here, um, but it's gonna come down further. Um, relocation isn't, isn't gonna be on the proposal, right? Yeah, I mean, that's not something that is within our, yeah. So do you, do you, have, do you have children? I do have, I have kids. So if, 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 children went to school in this vicinity and you have a choice to keep them or to move them, you work for the EPA, what would you do? Honestly. Yeah, I mean, I wish I could give you a yes or no answer because I, I know you want a yes or no answer, right? Um, but I can, I can tell you what, because there's so much that goes into considering where your kids go to school, right? Um, but I, I can tell you a few things that I would want to know if I were making that decision. Um, one is, um, some of what we talked about already, right? Which is when we're thinking about risk, we're really looking at risk over the course of a lifetime. So we are being conservative. I know it doesn't feel conservative, right? If your kids are there every day, and like you said, they're there for more hours sometimes and they're at home, mine are that way too. Um, but the other thing I would wanna know um, is when we think about cancer risk, 
Um, the National Cancer Institute um, estimates that 39% of Americans will develop cancer in their lifetime. Um, it's a lot. I mean, that's, that's a large number. When we're talking about one in 10,000, um, that's very concerning to EPA, right? And we're not going to quit until that number comes down. One in 10,000 from one chemical in one place is too high from our perspective. Um, but if you're talking about your overall cancer risk across your lifetime, it's probably a small piece of it. Um, so I, I think I would want to think through those things, um, but a lot goes into where you decide to send your kids to school, right? And if if you feel like as a mom that they're having health effects from being at this facility, right? That's different from, you know, if I tell you the, the sort of the data, right? Um, and so, and there may be other things in that community, right? That are also causing risk. And so I, I don't know that I can speak to all of those, those answers today, but I, a lot goes into a decision like that. Good evening, um, uh, Ed Rodriguez. We moved to the area about four years ago. Uh, and we've noticed a uh, very high incidence of cancer. And we've been talking about childhood uh, uh, illnesses. And, and, and uh, But um, what studies have been made, statistical studies, epidem epidemiological studies about the, for adults, cancer, uh, what seems to be uh, on a hearsay, a uh, very high cancer rate um, can happen in any part of the country, but we find it within uh, our neighborhood that we're living. Uh, any studies related to the ETO? So the, the iris value, the toxicity value is based on the best scientific studies there are across that have been sort of published across. And some of it's animal studies and then some of it is epidemiologic, um, but it's the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. Um, and I guess I should, let me take a step back because I probably, I, I totally glossed over a whole lot of how epidemiology is done, which is probably not fair for, for, um, for this room. So when I say animal studies, so a lot of research on how toxic something is um, looks at if you have a mouse or a rat and they're exposed to it, did they develop cancer? And we still study a lot of chemicals that way because uh, we don't want to expose humans to things, but it allows us to understand how toxic something is and at what level is that toxicity happening? Um, and then there's epidemiologic studies, uh, which are studies that actually look at who, which humans actually develop cancer. Um, and so some of, some of what went into IRIS was animal studies. Um, some of it was human studies. And notably, um, the best evidence, right, the evidence that really allowed us to understand that it was more toxic than we thought it was in the past was actually based on two what we call occupational studies. So studies of people who work at facilities very much like this one, right? And from that data, there was an indication that ethylene oxide causes an increase in breast cancer and an increase in, in lymphomas and blood cancers. Um, and so, so, yes, we do have good evidence that there is an association um, between ethylene oxide and cancer. Um, in terms of like incident studies, like community by community, there are some places where they've looked at that. Um, I don't believe there's anything in, in this area um, that has looked at that. Um, I know the health department um, is not here tonight, unfortunately, but that's more of a question for the health department. But the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry also helps support communities for those sorts of analysis at times. So they would also be a good group to talk to. As an agency, EPA, we don't do that kind of work. Um, I will say from my perspective, you know, our mission is to protect human health and the environment. So we really want that kind of work to be ongoing and we want to learn from those sorts of studies. But if, if people are already getting cancer, then we have failed at our job. Um, because we're not protecting health anymore. Um, but that doesn't mean that that sort of research is not very important. Um, and so, you know, I, I know my colleague, Michelle at ATSBR would be interested to hear from you and, and your concerns and she can maybe speak better to those, but she's not here tonight either, but Michelle's eager and we can provide contact information for them. In the, um, my name is Dwight Popovic and I live in the villas, uh, pretty close to the schools that are mentioned and everything. And uh, I go out at night with my dog all the time. Everybody knows my dog better than me. Uh, but um, I did have a real bad blood uh, droppage and had to have six pints of blood and uh, iron put into me and had no real cause for it. Uh, never, you know, the, the, the cancer doctors even said, we have no clue what's causing it. I don't know if it's the exposure to this, but you know, ETO 
has who is the manufacturer and have they been contacted and being told that you know this is a severe cancer causing agent and is there any way that they can remove perhaps a portion of whatever this magic potion is and still get the results without killing people thank you for your question i'm sorry to hear about your health concerns um i, I heard you ask about um whether or not manufacturers are considered so under the Clean Air Act, I think Tony might be able to speak speak to that as well. Um, in addition to um, the second part of your question, was can you can you repeat it? Sorry. Remove it. Yeah, if they could just remove one of the agents, you know, ATO, you know, who's the manufacturer? Find out who it is. What two, three, four, five complex chemicals mixed together are, and can one of those be removed and not make it a carcinogen any right, longer? Right. Okay, yeah, and there was some analysis that went into um, our our proposed rulemaking that I think uh, Tony and Madeline could speak to as well. Yeah, and, and to specifically answer your question, the agency is considering all of that as we look at this chemical and the impact that it's having on the communities. Are there alternative chemicals that can be used that can get the same results in terms of sterilization of this equipment? Um, can you use a lesser amount and still get the same results that you're looking for in terms of the sterilization and the, um, the, the, the killing of the germs and stuff that may be on these utensils that they're using in the surgical procedures? So all of that has been part of the process that the EPA has been talking about and going through as we look at how can we regulate this chemical going into the future. Yeah, I mean, there are different, different rules on the, manu on the manufacturing. Um, so um, what we talked about today was the rule that governs the commercial sterilizers and specifically, you're not considered a commercial sterilizer if you make EPO, right? You're not a manufacturer. That's by definition, you bring it in and you use it to sterilize things. But we are also, um, I, the Han, right, is, is um, what, why don't you talk about the rules for manufacturing because you know them better than I do. Okay, and, and I think we said at the beginning that there are a number of regulatory activities that the agency is looking at in terms of getting a better handle on this ETO and what's happening with it. Um, in addition to the um, niche app that we have for ethylene oxide um, sterilizers, in addition to the one that we have for PIPRA, we're also looking at making changes to the hazardous organic niche app rule that uses um, ethylene oxide as, as part of its processes. So that route. An acronym because it's an acronym that's really long within an acronym yeah. because that's how we do. That's, that's how we do. Um, but but that rule is going through the process and I think it's coming out. Is it coming out next year? It's coming out sometime. I don't know the date, um, but it's coming out next year. Hmm? And it's changing. coming out spring of 24 that's going to um, take into consideration what new controls that we put on those facilities to help control that ETO in that manufacturing process. Um, and, and just for informational purposes, I think in Region 4, there are only two facilities, two hard facilities um, that we'll be looking at in Region 4. And that's the eight southeastern states that we cover. But we will be looking at it nationally. And uh, the lady in front here that asked uh, who they could contact, uh, Public Work Center is where the zoning is. And it's on the second or third floor. I can't remember what floor exactly, but you can call, make an appointment, and they'd be glad to hear your concerns, and they will act heavily on it. And then the county commissioners are another good point. Uh, we've had some bad luck in the villas with past commissioners, but I can tell you, the guy we have in there now really cares. And uh, if he hears about this, I'm sure he'll get act actively involved as well. Thank you for sharing that. Um, The CTO that the facility uses, they don't destroy it. They don't transmute it into something else, right? It gets broken down in the control system. So it does get turned into something safer within the control system after it's used. In the control system. So if they buy X amount of it a year, then there's no way to tell how much of that escapes. Doesn't it all escape? So cur currently, well, now they have the controls, but before they had the controls, 
um, you know, it was it was easy to say what they used was what was released. But now with the control equipment that is in place and the type of testing that they have to do to, you know, show its efficiency and with the type of record keeping that they will be required to do um, before the rule is finalized, you know, we'll have the permit that FDP is working on with them. But then once we do have the final rule, then they will have to get a permit incorporating all of those requirements, which we'll see, which are, if it's finalized as proposed, it will be very extensive. And so they will know how much is being released. Of how much is used, how much is being released, they will know that. So the control captures it or destroys it? It captures and destroys it. Thank you all. I really appreciate your time tonight. Um, so my question was that map that you put up, the before and after picture, uh, when specifically was that, you know, when, when was that picture taken and when, not like it was a picture, but the, the map overall, and when, when was it taken after, or is that just a graph that we have an idea of? No, no, those, those mm -hmm. are actual data points okay. that we put through the EPA model to determine mm -hmm. what the impact was. The one on the left with the blue blob, that map was generated before we came to the June 22nd meeting. June 22nd, okay. Yes, and then the map on the right is the one we did, what, two, three weeks ago? Um, when we got the data from Hastings in terms of what they had gotten in their report of emissions from the facility, we regenerated that. So, okay. so it's recent. It's only two or three weeks off. Great. Thank you. And the ETO, how long is it in the air for before it disintegrates? It's roughly a few weeks, but it really depends on the weather and other things. So it's not, but a few weeks. Thank you. You want to read some, some of those? Okay. Yeah, I can get to I think they're kind of short. Okay. We can do that. Get yeah, we do. Uh, we've actually had two questions, I think, that have kind of been answered on the cards. One was, is there a plan for ongoing monitoring at the facility? And I think I answered that as far as what was proposed. Yes, those those types of requirements you know, were proposed, and we'll see what ends up getting finalized. Another question was, how long does it last? So Madeline just addressed that one. Um, another question I'll turn to Tony. Do you factor in the wind and the wind speeds uh, when showing the new model risk map? Yes, all of that meteorological data was included um, in their analysis when they fed that information from the test results over to Hastings at FDEP. Maybe I just add to in a few weeks. That's like if, like, that's when it breaks down, but like it does disperse faster than too. So. That might be helpful. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Melon. Um, and then another question is, uh, will the Fort Myers company take action on the fugitive leaks without EPA's requirement? Um, I'm going to turn that to Hastings um, just to check, you know, because they're talking to the facility more frequently than we are. Uh, so, you know, uh, as we discussed, once you kind of control the stack emissions, the, you know, uh, the fugitive emissions become more of a a larger portion of what's being emitted from the facility. Um, so, you know, as the compliance authority and regulatory permitting authority for this facility, you know, we've been in discussions with the facility and, you know, they're at this stage right now where they know that this rule is going to be finalized in a couple months. And as soon as that rule is finalized, that's going to give them the signal to know exactly what they need to do on exactly what. So, you know, there's controls for, post aeration handling of sterilized material. That's a new element of these regulations. And they're waiting to see what exactly are the control requirements because they're gonna have to design a system. So what we expect will happen is that the rule will go final and they will come to us and say, we need a permit from you guys to install all these new controls. Um, and so we will go through that process with them to make sure that they will be putting in the controls in the timeline specified in the rule and then we will hold their feet to the fire to make sure that the controls are installed, they're doing all the record keeping and reporting that's needed. And you know that's chasing down those fugitive emissions. So we've lowered the stack emissions. Um, the, the new rule requires even a tighter standard. Um, so what's currently the standard is 99% control. The new rule as proposed is 99.8% control. And there's gonna be controls on the fugitive emissions. So once those are taken into account, you know both sources of emissions will be controlled at the facility. So like I said, we do expect that that 
uh, ACS will come into us. And so will the other four facilities in Florida all coming in to make sure that they are in compliance with the rule because they're going to have to do a lot of work to meet all of these requirements. Um, the monitoring requirements for the continuous emission monitoring systems, if those are finalized, they're going to have to go out and hire consultants and, and manufacturers that build all this stuff and put all that stuff in. So it's going to be a very, you know, uh, fast 18 months for these folks and trying to get all this stuff done. So that's kind of what we see for moving forward with uh, additional controls. Now, are they fully operational while all of this is going on? Yes, you know, they, they are op they are uh, operating, uh, you know, they're meeting the requirements for their uh, you know, customers uh, for providing sterilized medical equipment for them. And, you know, uh, they shut down briefly you know, to install install the controls. But when they're testing, they have to be operating because there's, you know, you have to measure the pollutants. If they tested when they were not operating, you wouldn't see any ETO. So part of it is having to do this, right? They need to, you know, put on the SEMs and they need to be operating to show that the continuous emission monitoring system is working. Um, hopefully it'll be, you know, very, very low numbers, right? Because the controls that are being put on are going to be very stringent. Um, so, you know, that process, they they got to be operating for a lot of these processes to make sure that they're in compliance. Thank you, Hastings. We'll take a question from the back. So I have a number of questions that have come up. So one of the things I wanted to point out was, as as someone had mentioned earlier, that we're really looking at like the umbrella of Lee Health when we're talking about Arthrex um, and we're talking about the ETO use um, with the American contract system. Um, and uh, recently I've had some conversations about, you know, I think the use of the ethylene oxide at the facilities, the hospital facilities, as well as the combustion um, of some of the medical waste, you know, trying to get a handle on what's happening with that in terms of emissions, um, because we, we're talking about people that we trust to keep us well, not sick in us. Um, and the other thing is, you know, as these, these rules are coming online, I think we're really looking at two overlays. We're looking at the overlay of the facilities, and we know that there are different kinds of facilities that are releasing ETO, whether that be whatever's happening at the hospital or at these commercial sterilizers or down in <laughs> Collier County, but the overlay of the population. Because I, I see the, the risk based on the release of the gases, but, you know, there's kind of the, it's kind of obvious how dense this is, this area. And, you know, having that data about what's happening in our community or what's happening in other communities throughout um, Florida and the country, I think is really important uh, in, term, in terms of evaluating what is the real risk to people. It's not just the blue blob, <laughs> it's the, what is underneath the blue blob. I have a question about when we talk about the continuous monitoring, I'm not sure where that continuous monitoring is happening. And maybe that's not clarified yet in the rule. That's like in the facility in terms of OSHA and the, the workers, or is that continuous monitoring on the stack itself? Um, that's still not clear to me. And very importantly, the, the noticing process. Um, <laughs> I happened to stumble upon this on the EPA site. It sort of appeared out of nowhere. And in terms of the recent emissions with the, the, the waste to energy plant, you know, that was on the agenda of Board of County Commissioners meeting. I didn't see anything roll out with that. So I have some questions about the noticing, you know, um, how, are, how are communities learning about this stuff? Um, it, do these notices appear on a Friday afternoon and then vanish by Monday morning? Um, are the notices posted for, for 30 days and then they vanish? I, I, I'm, I've just got some real concerns about the, the noticing process. Now I'd like to have some clarity about that, not just in relation to this ETO issue, but in relation to other emissions that are occurring in our community, pollution, et cetera, um, and get some clarity on that. Okay, thank you for your question. Um, I've heard you mention a kind of an umbrella of exposures for ETO. You mentioned um, yes. hospitals and medical waste. And I also want to just, kind of let you know also that EPA is trying to improve our ability to look at something called cumulative risk, which yes. is, yes. So we, we are we are investing in that. It is a priority of this administration. Um, and we are working on 
uh, you know, figuring out how to do that is very complex. It's, it's complex enough to look at one chemical, but it is infinitely more complex to look at, at the broader suite of exposures in a community. But we are trying to figure out how we can do that. You know, we've got, you know, computers that are getting more and more powerful and there's ways we can use information. So we're, we're looking, looking at how to get better at that. And I just want to make sure that this whole room knows that, that EPA is striving to do a better job of that for communities um, and look at cumulative risk. Um, as far as public noticing, I may turn it to um, Hastings to kind of describe how when, when things are required to have a permit, what process goes, um, the process and procedures that go in place with, with notifying, um, you know, for public comment periods and that type of thing. Uh, thank you. So uh, Florida and the Clean Air Act uh, both have public notice requirements um, that apply, you know, varying uh, according to program. Um, so it's it's a very complex question, but for the sake of, you know, these facilities and Clean Air Act permitting, um, generally when a new facility is being built, they need to have what we call an air construction permit. And that air construction permit has to be publicly noticed in a newspaper of general circulation um, like a legal advertisement. And, you know, I'm sure everybody reads the paper and all the way through from front to back every day, right? So, you know, uh, you know, but that is the process in Florida for notifying the public. Now, if that's, you know, the other way to get involved is that you are able to reach out to us uh, through a number of channels to get information about what the department is doing, um, you know, for Florida, right? So I can only speak for Florida. Um, so Florida has a way that you can sign up and look for air permits in Lee County. So if you want to know every air permit in Lee County that's being applied for, we have a system called the Permit Application Tracking System, or PATS, right? Got to have an acronym for it. Um, and you can go in there and just put in your email address, and you'll get a, a, a record uh, each day that there's an application in Lee County. Uh, you could ask for the whole state. I have a PATS login for the entire state. So I see every air application that is submitted in the state. Um, but you can just sign up for the area that you're concerned about. If you wanted to have Lee County and Collier County, you can check both those boxes. And what you'll get is there's not hundreds of air permits being applied for every day. You probably won't receive a, an email notification that often. But what you will see is um, what's going to happen in March, right, when this rule goes final, is that uh, ACS is going to apply for an air permit to implement the new niche app. And what you will see if you've signed up for that system is a notification. It's all automated and it, it's going to say, uh, ACS has signed up for an air construction permit. And if you would like more information about this, please contact, you know, this specific person. It's likely going to be uh, us in the Division of Air Resource Management in Tallahassee who will be doing the permitting. And you can be asked to stay involved on that. So you're being notified that there's a permit application in. And then when we go forward, instead of having to read the newspaper every day, when we go out with our draft decision to say, here's what we're proposing to do, which comes along with a comment period, you're going to get direct notice of that sent to your email because you've asked. You said, hey, DEP, when you act on that permit, I want to be notified. And we will oblige you of that because you've reached out to us. And our permit writers will say, when we go out, please send this lady uh, the draft permit and tell her there's a 14-day comment period. There's also a 14-day petition period. You're allowed to have your administrative rights heard. Um, in Florida uh, through a Chapter 120 hearing. So those processes would all be made available. So if you want to take advantage of those, uh, that's the system for, for doing so. What about pollution then? Let's say that there's been a cloud, you know, there's been a, there's, there's been a pollution event. Right, so Florida does have a, a statute called the Public Notice of Pollution um, that was uh, created in like 20, 16 or 17. Um, it doesn't really work very well for air permits for a variety of reasons. It's mostly about like spills and things like that that occur at water facilities um, and things like that. But um, generally when something like that has happened, we make an assessment of whether or not they are in compliance with their permit. And um, it's more of a compliance issue if they exceed that. Um, than a notification process. There is a resource on EPA's website called Air Talk Screen. Um, and then regarding 
Yeah. You already mentioned EJ screen, but EJ screen and AirTox screen. So EJ screen is like covers more than AirTox screen, but if you're really interested in AirTox, AirTox screen is a pretty easy to use interface and has all of the all of the sources that we know of that are emitting air toxics um, that we have any data on are on there. And you can see um, what we know. Um, your question on hospitals, though, I just want to note there's a whole other rule that governs hospitals and it's a couple of years out. Um, and But we're working on that from the Clean Air Act side. On the FIFRA side, they did look at hospitals and I, you know, I, I can't say that this Clean Air Act is going to find the same because they're going to look at a much gran more granular detail. But when FIFRA looked at hospital risk, they found that for the most part, the risk is really inside the buildings to workers, that, that there's not a lot getting out. But the Clean Air Act is going to look a lot more detailed at hospital by hospital on more levels. So we may know more when they get to their part. I think if that's not wrong, Seneca. Seneca knows more. So, so th that is right. Um, I just wanted to mention you had mentioned the umbrella of ETO, the different places it's used, and the different kind of industries that work with it. So we do have a number of rules that you know govern those types of facilities. Today, we've been focusing on just one of them, just the subpart O, the commercial sterilization rule, because that's what you know is, is that's what that's what ACS is here. But we do have a number of other rules. Um, Madeline mentioned uh, chemical plants. That is actually the majority of ETO used and emitted. Um, is at chemical plants. We had one rule that's already been finalized um, for a couple of years. We have another one that is proposed that will be finalized uh, next spring. And then the uh, hospital sterilizers rule, which is in development. So there are a number of rules that are being proposed and worked on to get, yep, another one, um, to get the whole suite of, the whole suite of, you know, the uses of, of ETO. So, we are attacking it from every angle that we can. Today, we're just talking about you know the the FIFRA and the Clean Air Act commercial sterilizers because that's the most important. But we are attacking it from another a number of other angles. Uh, and then the final thing I heard you mention was asking about the continuous emissions monitoring systems. And there are we talked about two rules: the Clean Air Act and the FIFRA. So they they will have different monitoring requirements. So I will speak to the Clean Air Act uh, rule for commercial sterilizers. That uh, continuous emissions monitoring systems will take place at the stack. That will be at the stack and where I had mentioned that, you know, we're very confident in that technology and that will be continuously monitored. And then it will be periodically reported to the permitting authority, to FTEP. And that will be as part of the reporting and record keeping requirements that I had mentioned. So it will be monitored at the stack and then reported. Uh, yes, and then Madeline will talk about the FIFRA reporting monitoring requirements. And for that, I just, I want to acknowledge, I, I know I've said this a few times, but like what's in the proposal is not necessarily what's going to be final. And I just, the way these two regulations operate are very, very different. So I, I will tell you what's in the proposal for FIFRA. Um, I think we're more confident uh, on what might come out with the Clean Air Act uh, without being completely confident because we can't speak about it while it's still in, in proposal. Um, but on the FIFRA side, what is in the proposal is that there would be monitoring badges on actual workers throughout these facilities that would measure as low as we can. Um, and if there's a hit, then there, there would be these other things that would be triggered. And two other points I want to raise before we change subjects. Um, in terms of notification notice, if you will, um, the federal government, we publish a regulatory agenda that says these are the rules we're going to be working on over this period of time. And then when we get to those rules to start working on them, we do publish in the federal register um, a number of different times as we develop the rules. And when we make that publication, it notifies you that this is what the agency is thinking. This is the direction we're looking at going. And it gives you an opportunity to provide comments. And that comment is taken back, evaluated, and you know, and responded to either in the rule or why we don't think it's um, is fitting for that particular rule. But you know, and reading the federal register is something I know you're going to enjoy doing. <laughs> but we do tell people that these are the rules we're working on. Here's the one that's out for proposed rulemaking. Provide your comments, and and then we go from there. The other thing I want to remind you of is that EPA also have the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act. The Emergency Planning and Community Act, Community Right to Know Act, it says that if you are a facility that has these chemicals over this certain quantity, you are required to report them 
to the fire department, to the state, and to EPA on an annual basis. In the event that there's a release from your facility over a certain quantity, and the quantity is different from each chemical, you have to notify the National Response Center, which is um, managed by EPA's contractor, as well as the fire department of that release if it exceeds that quantity of, um, um, of release. And then that puts into motion a lot of different things, um, obviously. Um, number one, with the fire department, if there's an accident and they're coming to provide support to that accident, they need to know what chemical they're coming into and how to fight it appropriately. Um, with respect to the National Response Center, if that chemical is over that quantity of release, then that puts the federal government into motion to look into that and see how was it dispersed out in the community and then how we're going to address it. So th there are notification processes out there. And I know that it's so many, it's kind of hard to keep up with, but those two, number one for the rule development process and number two for accidents that happen um, in communities from facilities have, that have hazardous chemicals. So you can actually sign up for federal register notices. I get it every day and I read the federal register every day, but you can sign up for EPA specific actions. Um, and can you sign up for Clean Air Act only? I think that you can sign up for a specific type of programs as well. So I only see EPA actions that are getting proposed and sometimes it's one, sometimes it's like five or six. You can see both the proposed rules as well as the final rules. So you don't have to actually like go into the federal register and be like, oh my gosh, this is a data dump. I don't know what's going on. You can get it sent right to your email box. You just set it up from the federal register website and it will email you what you set up the link for. For the overachievers that love to read the register. <laughs> but I, I guarantee you there are a lot of us at EPA. We're a little over time. I don't have any more note cards. Um, so I may go ahead and proceed to close out. I wanted, we've been through some of these resource slides already. Again, I heard Marsha maybe raise a concern about the not getting a response to your question. Previously, I want to reassure you that I'm sorry for that. And I want to reassure you that we have a process in place to make sure that we, we answer these um, and get them. Sometimes they're not something that we have the subject matter expertise, but we'll connect with ATSDR, et cetera, and, and make sure that we get you in the right um, right place, depending on what your concerns are. So um, again, not sure if that was, uh, we had a bit of a virtual meeting snafu with the morning session last time, or if it was from our mailbox, but I want to apologize either way and, and ensure you that we'll, we'll make sure we, we get questions going forward. Um, and so we've had, got these resources again, our, our mailbox um, uh, on this on these slides, which we can post to our webpage. Um, we've got our facility specific webpage, which is where everything was posted, letting you know about this meeting and the fact sheet, et cetera. Um, and then our general EP, EPA ETO webpage, and we have some good fact sheets that have a lot of that information outside as well. Um, but that is a way to stay up to date. It's got all those rules that Seneca was talking about in one place on the federal side so you can kind of keep up with our actions what we're proposing what's finalized and all of the technical support documents that go along with all of that again we've shown this slide before but we do have region four partners with atsdr we've got leanne bing uh, again same regional footprint that we're in here in region EPA region four for epa um, and then the PACU is also this is a contact uh, for the region four area as well which of course is included uh, for florida and our final resource slide is our partners at OSHA. Uh, the Tampa area office also covers this area. So if you have any worker concerns, um, they are working um, on ETO as well and are aware of the issue. So um, if you have questions on the worker side, definitely reach out to them and this is their contact information. Um, at this point, I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Carol to uh, close us out. I really appreciate, oh. Yeah. Yeah. Before you transition yeah. this, Presentation on the website. Yes, we can get these slides posted on the web page. Um, and I think I think all the links work. So if we post it as a PDF, you should be able to kind of click without having to type it out. When and where would we be able to get the recording of today's meeting? So we um uh it's being recorded right now, and so it's we're doing that through Zoom and we have to get that download. I understand from our technical experts on that front that we'll have it um probably within the next uh, eight hours, be able to kind of download that as a big file because the recordings are really big files. Um, so we'll be able to download it and get it posted. She said not later than 24 hours. So we'll, on the facility specific um, webpage here, 
that we have where the fact sheets were and the information about this meeting. Yeah, it'll go there. Sorry? We can we can um, we can send a notification out uh, to the the folks who are so if you email our inbox, that's a good thing to mention. Thank you. Um, if you are interested in getting future updates about this specific location, we do kind of keep a, a community list going. And so let us know if you want to be added to that. Um, and we will definitely get your email address added. You'll get any notifications. Um, we can we can send out an update that our um, we can commit to sending out an update that our web page has updated with this recording. Um, but yeah, the recording itself would be too big of a file to email, but we can just remind you that it's there and it is, it is publicly available. Yeah, we yeah, yeah, we'll send the link. Yep. Um, and then again, if you know these rules finalize, they may not finalize at the same time based on what I'm understanding. But as as we do have actions that move forward on ETO as far as sterilization, uh, we can continue to to update through the um, the region four EPA gov list. So just let us know if you want those updates. All right, Carol, I will turn it to you now to close us out. With that, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight to take your valuable time to share with us your concerns. We appreciate it. We learn more from you. And um, as Erin had said, and, and I think a number of her speakers were here because um, this we're committed to helping and we are committed to the science um, and to working towards improving the risk. So it helps us to hear from you and what your concerns are. I know a number of us have been taking some notes and the recordings will help us as well. So stay in touch and um, thank you for being here. We'll be here for a little bit if you have additional questions. You know, we're not going to run out the door. <laughs>